we have six attending and unlike last meeting which was three plus hours of doza now we've got three different topics for variety something for everyone um let's start with items of interest from commissioners hearing none director's report Good afternoon. Uh, this will actually be a very short report. I just wanted to let everyone know that we have our residential infill um, work session tomorrow at council where we will walk through for council the different um, amendments that we've been hearing about um, from commissioners offices and we'll get signals from the council which have two or more um, support so then we can do the work. Uh, for next month, which will be March 12th, we have a scheduled um, hearing where we'll introduce the amendments and the amendment package for residential infill and we'll have the public hearing on March 12th. And then secondly, I sent this to you via email, but just to share with you, uh, we, the, um, we'll be releasing the climate emergency draft for public comment review um, uh, in the next couple of days, most likely tomorrow. And that'll be available for public review and comments for the next three to four weeks. The, um, we've had a uh, number of engagement with a number of community organizations, youth organizations over the last couple of months and gotten input from community uh, for this version of the climate emergency. And so we're looking forward to getting, opening it up for more public comments and review. And then um, the hope is to bring it to council in April. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one question for um, RIP2. Is that something that we could get maybe a little briefing to what as us being scoped out to deal with the R10, R20 areas and anything else as a future agenda item? Uh, yes. As soon as we finish RIP1, we can come back with RIP2, but our team is focusing on RIP1 first. But yes, Understood. we can absolutely do that. <laughs> Great. Let's go now to the consent agenda. We would like to move the approval of the minutes from our last meeting. So moved. A second? All in favor, aye. 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 That passes. Thank you, Chris. And let's move to the River Plan South Reese update. But first, I'm going to read a, um, I guess I thought I had a, um, well, Kat Schultz is going to be recusing herself from this um, topic um, in front of the PSC. And are there any other commissioners who have any other um, disclosures to make about the River Plan South Reach project? All right, hearing none, could staff please come on up and introduce us. We have Debbie Bischoff, Jeff, I don't know how to spell your last name, Cald Caldwell? Caldwell? Okay, and Ethan Brown. Push the button. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Debbie Bischoff, Senior Planner with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Um, it's a great pleasure for us to be here today to present to you an overview on the River Plan South Reach. This is a lovely photo that was taken by someone we know. Um, and it's a beautiful image of South Reach looking downtown. So what we'd like to do today is provide you some background information um, share with you recommendation highlights and information on related projects and answer any questions you might have. So the Willamette River is a very important and defining natural feature. It's been and continues to be a transportation and recreation corridor, a source for subsistence and a key resource in our ecosystem. The development of Portland over time has negatively impacted the health of the river. The city's river renaissance program of the 2000s envisioned and strategized about the Willamette River as a clean and healthy river, a prosperous working harbor, Portland's front yard for recreation with vibrant riverfront neighborhoods and partnerships to achieve the outcomes. To implement river renaissance, the river was divided into three unique reaches. City planning in the North Reach was accomplished in 2010. City planning in Central Reach was done in, with the Central City 2035 plan in 2018. And now it's South Reach's turn. The River Plan South Reach is an update to the 1987 Willamette Greenway plan. 
And this plan is a 20-year plan that includes a vision, policy framework, updated comprehensive plan map and zoning map and re zoning regulations. Um, it includes an action plan for short to long-term actions. And it also contains natural and scenic resource protection plans. So th this is um, our long study boundary area. So um, to, to the north, uh, which is the, the left side of the map, is the Ross Island Bridge. And um, we do not on the west side, which is the, the su southern portion of the map, as you're looking at it. Um, it does not include South Waterfront District, which is part of Central City. Um, so in this area, we, we are looking at the Brooklyn neighborhood on the southeast side um, and the Selwood neighborhood. And on the west side is the South Portland neighborhood. Um, we do go to the city limits on the eastern side of the river, um, and you will see a big green swath on the on that north side of the river, and that is Waverly Country Club, which is outside of our city limits and not included in our plan. But on the what looks like on the south, which is the west side of the river, um, we we do have a agreement with Multnomah County to do planning for unincorporated urban pockets, and so um, this river plan does include the Riverdale Dunthorpe neighborhood, and that is why our red study area boundary extends further to the south. So there's um, important policy guidance that um, that we are um, looking to in this planning project. First and foremost is our statewide planning goal 15, Willamette River Greenway. Um, and what it does is requires our city to have plans and development regulations that meet this goal. We also have a comprehensive plan policy that is specific to Southreach, and it really tells you what is most important about this particular reach. So we undertook um, in our planning process, we started two years ago and we began with trying to understand our South Reach area. Um, we have communicated and held numerous public events and meetings where we received comments that helped inform our plan development. We targeted outreach and engagement with Northwest tribes who have longstanding interests in South Reach past, present, and future as well as the urban native community. We produced two drafts of the River Plan Southreach, an intergovernmental review draft, which invited interested tribes and other federal, state, and local agencies to review and comment on it. More recently, we produced a discussion draft for public review. So for public engagement, again, we, we talked with and heard from many members of the public. Uh, this included people who live, work, recreate, and have specific interests in the area, such as a healthy ecosystem. We also met with federal, state, and local agencies and worked closely with uh, key city bureaus. And as I um, say these bureaus' names, I know we have staff in the audience. Could you please raise your hand for the bureau you represent? We have Portland Parks and Rec, Environmental Services, Office of Transportation. We also, again, because of planning in, the, in Multnomah County, Multnomah County planning was present and participated in our project. And we worked with these bureaus individually and also as an inter-bureau team. For general outreach, we held a variety of public events and meetings, a visioning event, riverfront walks and boat tours, topical meetings on natural resources, recreation, in riverfront communities and open houses on the whole variety of topics. The project team recognized early on, as I said, that the Willamette River area is, is of great importance to Northwest tribes and the urban native community. We discussed River Plan South Reach with tribal nation representatives and staff at a tribal conference, the city's tribal nation summit, and at the inter, inter sorry, Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. 
Project staff visited tribal staff at the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and held a conference call and received comments from Confederated Tribes of Umatilla staff. We we're also part of a city delegation to the Confederated Tribes of Yakima Nation and recently met with the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde staff. We coordinated with Portland Parks and Recs, Native American uh, Community Advisory Council and PSU's Indigenous Studies Program to hold an urban native community event at Portland State on this project. These efforts provided an opportunity to share project information and, gave, and gain valuable insights and recommendations from the different Native American perspectives. As I mentioned, we produced these two drafts in recent months, an intergovernmental review draft, and we invited interested tribes and other government partners to review it. In October, we made the discussion draft available. It was the first planned document for public review. And the, this proposed draft that you have before you is the subject of our uh, February 25th hearing and work sessions and is a refinement of the discussion draft. So this is the vision um, for the South Reach with part of an urban design concept blueprint for the future that emerged from the planning process. It, de it depicts the physical ideas for things like in-river habitat enhancement and restoration and boating facilities. Uh, <clears throat> so hi, again, my, my name is Jeff Cottle at the Bureau of Planning Sustainability. So I just wanted to highlight some of the, I'm a kind of the environmental planner on this team related to some of the changes that we've made uh, related to uh, the watershed health and resilience uh, chapter. So here's another uh, beautiful uh, photo of Oaks Bottom, uh, Ross Allen and with, uh, and the downtown uh, to the, to the north. So as we approach this project, we really had a number of objectives that guided our watershed health and resilience sort of discussions and, and, and the eventual um, section. So given the abundance of natural resources in the area, it's important that we uh, provide appropriate protections for existing uh, natural resources and that future development be designed to minimize impacts on those, on those natural resources. Um, additionally, uh, with the changes expected due to climate change, including increased flood and wildfire risk, um, we really felt it uh, necessary to take proactive measures to reduce these risks uh, wherever possible and then ensure resilience in future design and development. Um, additionally, as a, in response and, and, uh, to the National Flood Insurance Program biological opinion that was adopted, that was released in 2016, that uh, Ethan will tell you a little bit more about at the end of our presentation. Uh, we incorporated a number of steps to expand floodplain habitat uh, within the South Reach for threatened and endangered species, and that really was a key driver uh, of our work. And then to ensure long-term improvements in the river, as well as within habitat corridors that uh, stretch out from the South Reach, uh, the identification of habitat restoration opportunities was also an important piece of our work. So a significant update that we're making in the South Reach, that we're proposing in the South Reach, is a replacement of the existing greenway overlay zones with the river overlay zones. Um, the currently, uh, I mean, the either the river general or river recreational overlay zone will be applied to all parcels in the South Reach. Um, the river overlay zones are currently already applied in the Central Reach, so it's an expansion of those zones into the South Reach. Um, <laughs> The river recreational overlay zone is applied only really to public properties with river dependent or river related recreational uses, but one of those two kind of base overlay zones, not to confuse the terminology, but uh, will be applied to all the properties in our, in our study area. In addition to those two, uh, we are proposing that the river environmental be applied to high and medium ranked resources, natural resources, um, and um, the entirety of the floodplain. Um, additionally, we, uh, we're proposing that the river environmental apply to upland um, oak habitat, which we consider special habitat areas. Um, I'll highlight some of the updates proposed as, the, uh, as a part of the South Reach project, but an important component of this update, uh, and, and I'll do, the, do that in future slides here, but an important uh, component of the update is the establishment of development standards. 
So in the existing greenway overlay zone, pretty much everything has to go through river review, to go through greenway review. So as a part of this, uh, pr this project, we're adding um, specific standards for types of development, uh, specific types of development uh, to make it uh, more efficient in terms of approval. Um, so there are a number of key protections that we are proposing for the riverbank, both uh, in some cases in the water um, and also primarily on land. So the first proposal is a 50-foot river setback. Uh, and that's 50 feet from top of bank that will be applied throughout the South Reach. Um, there have been some requests for larger, a, a larger uh, river setback. We did an evaluation uh, of, the, of a potential larger setback, both at 75 feet and 100 feet, and uh, we determined that the number of additional non-conforming structures that would be created and the parcels that would be completely within the setback uh, warranted keeping the 50-foot setback. And we can talk more about that in the future. I'm sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the landscape standard has also has been streamlined. Uh, what we are proposing um, reduces complexity, makes it less pres prescriptive, but still meets the intent of the existing landscape standard, and so it'll allow more flexibility for, for development proposals, and those are only triggered during actual development, not, um, it doesn't apply if you're just replacing a tree, that sort of thing. Uh, the proposed code narrows the vegetation removal that, that is allowed on, uh, via an exemption, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we're um, dealing with vegetation removal. And then also floodplain management, as I, as I mentioned, flood management regulations were updated, and I'll also give you more detail on that uh, in here in a few slides. Uh, in the river, a new res residential dock standard is proposed. Uh, that standard would limit residential docks uh, to areas outside of shallow water habitat and then establish a 200, foot, uh, 200 square foot limit on dock size. If an applicant would like to build a, uh, have a larger dock than 200 square feet, they could uh, do that, but it would require land use review. So related to, you know, a key, a, a lot of discussions, we've had a lot of discussions through our process so related to vegetation removal, uh, especially specifically on the riverbank. So we, um, there are a number of steps that we are taking to try to ensure that vegetation um, is maintained because in a, in a number of cases, riverbank vegetation has been frequently cut back, especially um, on the west side of the river in the South Reach, uh, preventing the establishment of larger trees and a more diverse riverbank habitat. So in this, in our, in the river overlay zone, as we are proposing for the South Reach, there's minor changes to what exists now. Uh, there'd be no exemptions for removal of native vegetation at all, depending on no, no matter what the size of tree or uh, any uh, non-tree vegetation, and only nuisance trees less than one and a half inches in diameter um, would be allowed uh, in addition to non-native vegetation that are not trees would, would be allowed to be removed from uh, with, through the exemption. In both cases, the disturbance area associated with those replacements would be uh, landscape, you would need to, uh, to plant uh, per the landscape standard uh, to, to, um, in those areas. Some tree removal will be allowed via standard, uh, but those are very specific, including when there's a dead, dying, and dangerous tree, or there's trees within a, a view corridor, and we can talk more about that, I'm sure we will. Um, and removal that is a part of meeting other existing standards in the code. Other than that, we would basically, all tree removal would require uh, river review. So in addition to vegetation management, as I said, we have a number of uh, actions or changes that we're proposing related to floodplain management. Um, and Ethan will provide you with a little bit more background and, and um, more information on the overall city uh, work that's going on related to floodplain management. But um, so in response to that biological opinion that I referenced to, we have re re referenced, we have a couple of, uh, a number of updates. Uh, first, we would apply the river environmental to all floodplains. So in the past, we have uh, only applied the environmental zoning to uh, the undeveloped floodplain. We see the, the uh, application of river environmental to developed floodplain as valuable as well in terms of um, long-term improving habitat in those, in those areas. Um, 
the floodplain, as we are defining it, includes both the 100-year floodplain and the 1996, the Metro Title III 1996 flood uh, inundation area. So that's more of an actual extent and in many cases goes beyond the 100-year floodplain. In some cases, is actually less than the 100-year floodplain. Um, within the river environmental, we have, we're have changing a little bit about how to treat the tree replacement ratios for some, uh, certain size trees, um, requiring that any a question when you said there's two different floodplain maps at first i thought you were going to say it was the greater area between both of them but it, then you made said something that made me think that it's a little bit less it is the it is the the, the furthest extent of either either of those okay. two yep. yeah. so it's kind of we're combining them into one floodplain map for for this project yeah um any mitigation uh, resulting that it, that is proposed in the floodplain would would be required to uh, i mean any development impacts in the floodplain would need to be mitigated in the floodplain and instead of outside of the floodplain if there if a parcel has that um, the code has also been updated to allow for the use of mitigation banks in the future we see this as another tool um, for offsetting uh, development impacts and so that would be in addition to right now you're allowed to, to mitigate on site or to mitigate off site if you have control of, a, of another property in some way that meets certain requirements um, and then finally, we are proposing the establishment of a, of a new riparian buffer area. Um, so the riparian buffer area is an area where uh, impacts associated with non-river dependent or river related development would be required to go beyond our existing no net loss standards. So you would need, this would require documentation that a significant improvement in at least one of um, three floodplain functional values is demonstrated. So over time, we would see improvement in that area. Um, and again, this is in response to ensuring um, uh, additional habitat for threatened and endangered species. Um, the riparian buffer area is located, um, it's 170 feet from ordinary high water, um, but it is contained by the floodplain. So if, if the floodplain extent, as we talked about, of those two is, is less than 170 feet, it would be cut off at the floodplain. The map uh, up on the screen now shows an example of riparian buffer area, and it includes, um, and this is around the Selwood Bridge, the eastern side of the Selwood Bridge. So you can see this, the, the map shows in kind of a orangey color, um, a little bit distorted here, um, is the river setback, the 50-foot river setback, and then the riparian buffer area, again, 170 feet from ordinary high water in a sort of more purple. Um, so staff believes that <clears throat> in combination, the, the river setback and the riparian buffer area provides necessary, necessary protections of natural and uh, flood, prone er flood prone areas uh, adjacent to the river. And so between these two, um, I think we uh, are adjusting some of the concerns that have been raised related to a larger setback. Thank you. Okay, I will um, just talk about a few topics here. Um, so recreation, the South Reach is a recreation hub, um, I think for the region, not just the city of Portland. Um, there's at least 11 parks and natural areas. There's um, numerous boat facilities, both public and private. And so it's a really key piece of, of, um, of this river plan. Um, so with that, um, these are some objectives of the recre for recreation in this plan. Um, they involve, make, you know, improving upon physical facilities and programming, increasing riverfront access, uh, addressing conflicts between recreational users and impacts on natural resources, protecting public views, um, and partnerships, which all of these things are important in their, in their own way. Um, first, I would like to just talk about on-land recreation. Um, Willamette Park is a very well-used park in South Portland on the west side of the river. Um, it has had a master plan completed and the first phase implemented, but it does have a second phase that's unfunded. Um, it includes um, some natural resource uh, restoration with layback of the riverbank um, and some restoration um, improvements, but also uh, the possibility for a seasonal public swimming beach and also um, a non-motorized 
light watercraft boat launch. Currently, there's a motorized boat launch at Willamette Park. Um, another important project that needs to happen is the Ross Island Oaks Bottom Complex Management Plan. Um, you know, you're, I think you're all familiar with Ross Island in the center of the river, um, and it's an area that will hopefully transition to more natural resources more completely over time, um, but also with Oaks Bottom Wildlife Management Refuge and all of the other acreage of public land um, in the southeast side of the river, um, there's a great opportunity to do a natural resources um, protection plan, but also look at where there's opportunities for some uh, recreation when it's appropriate. So um, that is a, a desired project um, that is a pri priority to Portland Parks and Rec, and I would imagine the Bureau of Environmental Services. Um, there's also um, Brooklyn Riverfront Access and Park, which I'll talk about a little later, um, and trail improvements. Most of the, we have a greenway trail system on both sides of the Willamette River and South Reach. Um, the trail system is pretty complete. However, there are still a few gaps in the, on the east side of the river, and there's also a desire for expansion of that trail system. So I'll, I'll talk about that um, under transportation a little more. Um, and then we do have a provision in this um, plan that allows a limited amount of commercial development at three parks. Um, it's Willamette Park, Selwood Riverfront, and a future park that is um, Multnomah County owned the former Staff Jennings Marina Center um, to really serve recreationalists um, in, the, in the South Reach by providing perhaps boat rentals and cafes, refreshments, things like that. And these businesses, um, I know that Parks and Rec, um, this provision has been implemented in the Central City uh, as part of the Central Reach Plan. And I know that um, Parks has some guidelines as to when they move forward on that, that it'll be local businesses and, and they have criteria with which they will um, have the tenants uh, locate there. So for in-river recreation, again, there's opportunities to upgrade existing facilities and to provide new facilities. Um, there's partnerships and a public swimming beach. Um, one example of a new facility would be a, a new a light watercraft boat launch on the north side of Selwood Bridge at the end of Southeast Spokane Street, which is formerly the launch for the Selwood Ferry, which was in existence prior to the Selwood Bridge. So you already have a ramp down to the river that's not in good condition, but could be refurbished to create provide more riverfront access. Um, partnerships are, are really important here. And one example I want to give, um, if any of you are out on the river in the summer in this area or, or along the riverfront, you'll notice a lot of boating activity. And it's boating, all kinds of boating from rowing shells to dragon boats to stand up paddle boarders to motorized boats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in recent years, there's an advent of um, wake enhancing devices on boats that are used for recreation purposes for folks to water ski or, or, or board um, in the water. Um, it creates excessive wake energy that has capsized um, non-motorized boats, uh, shells, rowing shells. It's, I think, a couple of rowing shells have broken in half from it. Um, we have floating homes in the South Reach area, and homeowners have um, complained that they've had um, monetary, you know, costs associated with damage to their, their homes from this energy. And there's also um, um, impacts perhaps on the shallow water habitat and, and the natural resources, erosion perhaps of the riverbank. So with that, a, a key partnership that has just happened is um, the Oregon State Marine Board is the, the, the body that regulates um, activity on the river. And they have convened a rule advisory committee to look at rules um, for boating in the lower Willamette that is from Willamette Falls to the confluence of the Columbia River. The most congested and problematic area is South Reach. So right now, um, there's a rulemaking committee with a variety of interests on it. 
and they will be um, making recommendations, hopefully, uh, rec to the Marine Board this spring. The goal would be to have new rules in place by, by summer. Um, so I just wanted to make you aware of that one type of partnership to deal with kind of um, congestion enforcement issues, but certainly education um, of all boaters. There's all kinds of partnership opportunities, whether it be with state agencies or, or recreation groups, organizations, et cetera. And I should just um, add um, a public swimming beach study. I just wanted to mention that 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 there is a renewed interest with um, with swimming in the river and a future action would be to look at potential swimming sites um, for, for public swimming beach for families in our area, for our region. And um, that would look at characteristics, um, site considerations, accessibility, and also effects on shallow water habitat. So that's in the plan also. Um, scenic resources is another, as I mentioned, we completed a scenic resources protection plan. Um, and in that, we inventoried existing and proposed viewpoints, view streets, and scenic corridors. An evaluation of potential conflicts, um, such as buildings with vege and vegetation within the view corridor. And the plan has recommendations for protection of scenic resources and the retirement of certain resources that don't meet the plan's criteria. Some viewpoints are targeted for amenities, such as benches, lighting, and other improvements. And they're identified in a new zoning map in um, Chapter 480. Um, and planting of trees, I just want to um, let you know that planting of trees and view corridors associated with South Reach viewpoints um, is prohibited, though any trees required to be planted must be planted outside the view corridor. Veg vegetation management and removal of existing trees is allowed to preserve public views. Tree replacement outside of the view corridor would still be required. And here's um, a couple of views for you. Okay, another section of our plan deals with tribal engagement and collaboration. And the city of Portland is formalizing government to government relations with Northwest tribes that have an interest in the Portland area. I'm pleased to say Laura John, um, could wave your hand, is our city's tribal relations director and has been working hard to develop ongoing formal collaboration. Through an annual tribal summit between tribal and city officials, project staff were able to inform tribal representatives about the River Plan Southreach and welcome their participation in the project. We invited tribal governments to review and comment on that inter intergovernmental review draft I mentioned. And um, we've met with them, as I also mentioned, um, their staff at meetings and received comments from different tribe staff on this intergovernmental review draft. Included in the plan is also some um, amendments to our comprehensive plan uh, policies to um, acknowledge the tribal to acknowledge tri uh, tribal nations in an appropriate manner, and in the plan we want to continue to work cooperatively with tribal representatives and the urban native community to expand on programs and projects that support customs, tradition, and culture. Examples include planting first foods like camas, creating a canoe family boating facility, and holding cultural events like a salmon celebration. Another aspect of our, our plan is um, archaeological resources protection. Um, project staff hired a professional archaeologist to research native history and significance of the South Reach area. This is pre-European American contact. While not a lot of information and resources have been identified, we know this area was, and in some instances still is, a usual and a custom place for fishing and gathering of cultural resources like Wapato at Oaks Bottom area. This area was traveled through by canoe and other means en route to Willamette Falls for training, trading amongst native peoples. 
the archaeologists developed a probability model for where resources are more likely or not to be found. It's based on a previous model done in the North Reach for the Superfund area and looked at the pre-contact landscape and topography. A plan proposal requires a survey on a site in the high probability area, and that's the area in red on your map, um, when a disturbance permit is required by the city, and that's for activity that's 200 square feet or greater. Unless there's documentation already to state the site was already surveyed and there's no archeological resources on site. The extent of surveying depends on the size of the disturbance area. If a professional archeologist that's hired to complete a survey finds cultural resources, they are to notify the city that SHPO and interested tribes will be made aware of the discovery to engage them in an appropriate way on how to resolve the situation. The details are in the code language, which is based on a similar requirement that was put in place in the Columbia South Shore Plan District in the 1990s. We also, one last piece is we wanna share in public information on something called inadvertent discovery plans, which is what the general public needs to know if they should come across some cultural resources um, and that would be outside of, of this regulation. So another topic is riverfront communities. And these are um, some of the objectives in the plan. And again, it's about uh, neighborhood riverfront access, improvements to transportation facilities and services, enhancing riverfront development and design, and, ad and addressing the, the issue of houselessness. In terms of riverfront access, um, the Brooklyn neighborhood in Southeast Portland has a longstanding desire for safe pedestrian and bike connections to the Springwater Corridor Trail and the river, and also the development of a riverfront park by the trail. This was in their 1991 neighborhood plan, and it still remains unfunded at this time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most of the riverfront trail system in South Reach is built. However, there's still a few gaps on the east side of the river, and there's also long-range desires to expand the trail on the west side to Lake Oswego. And finally, while there is good access into the river for boating and potentially swimming, um, access can also be enhanced on, on both sides of the river, and I highlighted that in the recreation section. So in terms of transportation, I just wanna talk about um, three aspects here. Uh, transit service is not optimal in the project area. Most bus lines only offer weekday and or commuter hour service only. Uh, there's minimal or no evening and weekend service. It's difficult for visitors, employees like those at Oaks Amusement Park and residents to take full advantage of transit for their daily trips. Active transportation is important in South Reach with the trail system along the riverfront and as an overall destination. We want to ensure pedestrians and bicyclists can safely cross major streets like McLaughlin Boulevard on the east side, McAdam Avenue on the west side, and Southeast Tacoma Street in the Selwood Bridgehead area. There's one multimodal conflict I just wanna mention, um, and that's in the vicinity of Selwood Riverfront Park by Southeast Spokane Street and the Springwater Corridor Trail. When summer activities happen at the Springwater, at Selwood Riverfront Park and or Oaks Amusement Park, there are often safety conflicts between trail users, motorists, pedestrians, uh, people traveling to destinations there and through the area. Um, there's just, a, there's not clear pathways um, and often there's a lack of parking in the area. So motorists are, are circling the neighborhood, creating more conflict in the area. So this area is one um, location we identified for future study um, and for this issue to be resolved. So development and design, um, how new development is designed and built um, and how it relates to the riverfront is a, is a topic of interest to both um, project staff and community members. 
Um, there's two areas in the South Reach where the design overlay zone is applied. One is the Selwood Bridgehead area, and the other is the South Portland neighborhood in the Southwest Macadam area, and it goes to the riverfront. Um, project staff work with, I know you're meeting with the DOZA project staff uh, this afternoon, but we work with DOZA staff to ensure that the river pattern area from our comprehensive plan was reflected in the citywide design guidelines and that the design standard amendments also relate to the river since we do have this two-track system for approval. Um, the currently applied McAdam Design District special design guidelines are from 1985 and are recommended to be repealed and replaced with the citywide design guidelines. DOZA will likely be adopted by City Council prior to River Plan Southreach. One context guideline in the citywide design guidelines calls for using information like past plans and a character statement to help understand the context of an area. Project staff met with community members recently and has developed a first draft of a McAdam District character statement to be adopted with the repeal of the special design guidelines for, the, for McAdam. We anticipate that you will receive testimony at the hearing on the draft character statement. We hope that you will offer your re recommendations for repeal of the special design guidelines and the new draft character statement to the, to the design commission. Since the Design Commission is the keeper of the citywide design guidelines, we plan to schedule a public hearing and notice the public on a hearing before the Design Commission in May or early June after they act on DOZA. We will then include the Design Commission's recommendation along with the PSC's recommendation on the River Plan Southreach as we schedule and hold the City Council public hearing later this summer. Just real quick on the McAdam character statement, um, it provides both background information about the district, um, but it also informs on community character, architectural character, natural resources character, and scenic resources character. Um, and key themes relate to this area's proximity to the river and its type topography, the fact that there's um, there's a desire to connect people with the riverfront and how architectural design accomplishes that. There's importance about um, the river corridor being a Pacific flyway for birds and the connectivity to the river and the natural resources such that native plantings and habitat friendly development happens. And then also um, acknowledging the scenic resources protection plan and what views um, need to be protected. Finally, um, this is a, a very um, hard issue, as we all know in our community, it's a humanitarian issue at, at a large scale is the houseless community. Um, and it, it is something that is um, pervades the South Reach. It's in the South Reach. We do have riverfront campers and live aboard boaters. Um, this plan has a really limited uh, role in addressing this issue. Um, however, there is an action in the plan that supports coordination with the Joint Office of Homeless Services um, to try to help folks who are um, living outdoors um, in this situation. Um, and that's how we are addressing it. Finally, there are some South Reach amendments to um, to uh, River General, River Environmental, and sites that have scenic resource overlays applied to them. Um, as Jeff mentioned, or as we've mentioned, the, the river overlay zones were previously adopted for Central Reach, and some of the changes that we have made to, for, on behalf of South Reach, are being applied to the Central City area, to property owners there. Um, you can see what those recommendations are. And um, one thing that we, we did um, do with the scenic resources, we have updated um, the same recommendations for Southreach again, that we, some select um, locations may need to provide um, amenities with uh, their scenic viewpoint area. Um, and we now have a map showing which those select scenic 
um, locations are. But I want to let you know that we notified the potentially affected property owners in Central City of these changes. We held a um, meeting, a question and answer meeting for them, um, and they are aware of these minor changes to, to the code. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ethan Brown. Is that on? Yes. All right. Um, so I'm Ethan Brown with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability as well. Um, I'm an environmental planner that's working primarily on our floodplains management update project. Um, and the reason we're bringing this to you um, now is we've included some of, uh, of those changes in the Southreach plan. Um, I just want to give a little context and, and background in terms of flooding. This is Vanport in 1948, um, just to give an overall why, why this is an important project and, and how we've um, not necessarily planned accordingly in the past. Um, so we're starting with the Southreach for mainly two reasons. One was opportunistic that we had this project already underway. It was primarily focused on, and it had a large portion that was on environmental issues in the Southreach. And also the Southreach contains um, uh, some of our largest extents of an undeveloped floodplain in the city of Portland, that, um, primarily in, in Oaks Bottom and areas that we have recently uh, reconnected or better connected with the project that was just completed there by BES Parks and the Corps. Um, in terms of flooding in Portland, just it's it's a good thing to keep in mind that, um, especially for people that are new to Portland, is we tend to we get floods every few decades. Um, we've had major ones. Um, the most major was in 1894, that uh, flooded all of all of downtown to the park blocks, um, and then again in 1948 the Vanport flood, as well as 1964 that's shown here on the central east side, and um, the 1996 is the most recent major flood uh, to hit the Willamette and the Columbia. Um, so we just want to give a brief intro of what this project is doing, um, both in the Southreach and beyond, as, as this will be coming back to the PSC shortly. Um, Jeff mentioned a, a biological opinion previously, but to give some context, um, the reason, one of the reasons we're really working on this is the um, participation in the National Flood Insurance Program, which is run by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, and this is a, a, a program that provides subsidized flood insurance to property owners within the 100-year floodplain as mapped by FEMA. Um, Portland has participated in that um, for a long time and also in the community re uh, rating system, which is a, a way to reduce those premiums. And our current rating um, gets us a 20% reduction in, in, in that, uh, those premiums. And the continued participation in this program will be dependent on our compliance with the biological opinion. Um, so basically, there was a legal challenge that uh, found that the program, I, how the FEMA applied, um, um, enacted this program, facilitated development in the floodplain and harmed endangered species, it pri primarily um, threatened and endangered salmon and steelhead. Um, so the resulting biological opinion that was uh, written by the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is uh, the manager, the federal manager of marine species um, for uh, protection under, under the Endangered Species Act, uh, found that the NFIP program, the flood insurance program, and the associated development was harming and continues to harm salmon. Um, and as part of that, the city has land use authority, and so it's 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 FEMA's position that it's the it's the individual municipality's jurisdiction to to implement this development re these development regulations. And so, we're still at if we don't change anything, we'll continue to be at legal risk from third party lawsuits for um, take or harm of salmon and steelhead. Um, and as part of this biological opinion, there was a reasonable and prudent alternative, which was a series of, of recommendations that um, the National Marine Fisheries Service, also referred to as NOAA Fisheries, made on how we could regulate development uh, to protect floodplain and improve habitat. Um, FEMA was required to, to provide guidance for municipalities in response to this biological opinion, but they were granted an extension by um, Congress uh, for additional three years, and we expect to have that guidance at the end of 2021. Now, the implementation period and why we're moving forward ahead of them, but in close collaboration, is that um, once that guidance comes out, our legislative process would not be fast enough to keep up with to, to get those um, recommendations enacted in a reasonable time. Um, and so just 
as part of more context of, of where are salmon and, and steelhead in our city, uh, these, the colors shown on this map are different species of Chinook, coho, sockeye, chum, steelhead, um, and cutthroat trout that are, um, have been documented by BES throughout our city. Um, and so you can see in the South Reach and in the Columbia primarily, as well as Johnson Creek and Crystal Springs, which is um, a salmon sanctuary, that um, we have salmon and steelhead across, uh, across our city. Um, and for the most part, their habitat coincides with our floodplains. And so the blue shown here is both the 1996 flood extent as well as the 100-year floodplain. So essentially, this is where we're talking about when we're talking about the floodplain management update program. Um, and it, it's important to note that the biological opinion and also our city goals and policies um, uh, relate to uh, including climate change and um, sea level rise in our in our work. Unfortunately, um, modeling and mapping changes by climate change in the Willamette and the Columbia is something that's beyond the capacity of the city of Portland right now. Um, and so part of this will be um, trying to collaborate to, to move forward with once maps are updated by FEMA um, and or the core, then we'd be able to incorporate those changes into our management. Um, regulations. And this is the South Reach and Johnson Creek, as well as Fano and Tryon Creeks, where you where we have uh, floodplains mapped in this city. Um, citywide, we have over 6,500 acres of floodplain across um, around 3,800 individual tax lots. Of these, about 1,300 of them are located in this area of Johnson Creek and Lentz, um, which are primarily residential lots um, that uh, flood in, but to a shallow amount. So the I have a question on that. Yeah, are those all the floodplains? I thought Holgate Lake or areas around Powell Butte are those not are those on a different map or um, are they not floodplains the designated? So uh, Powell Butte, I don't know if you can see my cursor on this is here. Okay. Yeah, and so the the floodplain that's Lentz and coming out is is that area and that the lake you refer to is around this area. So they're shown. Yeah, this is all the areas that we have mapped floodplains currently. Um, um, so there's three components principally for this update. Um, and the one that will most relate to the work here is developing regulations to maintain functioning floodplains and protect them. Um, BPS is leading the regulatory component in close coordination with um, BDS, Bureau of Development Services, and BES. And the program as a whole includes participation from um, Portland Prosper, Portland Parks and Rec, Office of Government Relations, City Attorney, and Office of Management and Finance. Um, Additionally, the two other components are creating and funding, really establishing a plan to restore floodplains that's that's budgeted for, and and we can we can take back to NIMS and say this is what we are doing for floodplains, and then also exploring how we as a city can and can uh, facilitate and use mitigation banking with this in, within the city. So, any impact to development from additional regulations can be offset through um, mitigation banking if necessary. Um, yeah, so the changes we're proposing, and, and Jeff mentioned some of them, we're starting with the South Reach, so there's really at least three phases to the regulatory side of things. Um, we are uh, addressing floodplains in the South Reach, primarily in, well, only in Title 33 in the zoning code, in um, the river overlays and the river review chapters with uh, increased tree replacement ratios, as was, ma as was mentioned, um, the riparian buffer area with additional mitigation requirements and limitations, as well as allowances for mitigation banking and some additional permit and land use submittal requirements to, to be clear on what's necessary when you submit for a permit. Um, as we move forward, the next phase that's already underway is this floodplain focus project, which is what I'm working on that's primarily focused on the, on the floodplain and issues, and we expect to have a discussion draft public um, this summer. And the change from the South Reach is that as part of this project, we're going to be updating Title 2450. So that's the flood hazards chapter of the building code, which contains the balance cut fill requirements and other requirements for, for how you develop in the floodplain, the physical structures in the floodplain. Um, so we're proposing, uh, we anticipate proposing changes, and this is working in close coordination with our floodplain manager at, at BDS. Um, and we're anticipating changes to uh, 
modify the cut fill ratios, um, increasing the clarity and flexibility for how we do compensatory cut. So essentially when you put in fill, then you have to take out an equal amount or more than an equal amount is what we'll be proposing. And so we'll be clearing that up. There's some issues with that on how it's implemented currently, as well as mapping a high hazard area, which is the greater of the 10 year flood interval or the floodway, whichever is greater. And that's really the areas where where it frequently floods and where salmon frequently inhabit. Um, and then we'll also be mapping, well, we have already mapped it, the full extent of 1996 flooding, which would um, uh, clear up where exactly uh, floodwaters happened in 1996. Um, We'll really be focusing our Title 24 changes on um, increasing ratios in the areas that frequently flood in that high hazard, as well as making distinctions between areas that are managed or unmanaged. So um, in the Columbia Slough, once you get past a certain point, it's, it's managed by the drainage districts, which has a different, um, would have a different set of requirements than the areas that have no control from a, um, from a local uh, drainage district standpoint. Um, the Title 33 changes will focus primarily and on the environmental zones. So similar to the river environmental, we uh, most of our floodplains outside of, of the Greenway, outside of the Willamette, are already contained or partially contained by the environmental zones in 33-430. And so we anticipate expanding those zones in Fano and Tryon Creeks to uh, encompass all of the floodplain, as well as expanding the river overlay zone in the central reach to match what was done in the, is going, is proposed in the south reach. Um, because this is a joint project, our uh, collaboration between BDS and BPS, um, you'll be seeing the Title 24 and the Title 33 changes together. Um, and we'll be continuing with the idea of increasing tree replacement ratios, um, making sure that we mitigate for functional value replacement, as well as mapping the right prey and buffer in the central reach, and applying some additional limitations on land divisions and impervious surfaces. Um, then the third phase plus. Um, I'll jump in. We're down to five minutes left. Can yeah. will there be time for us to have a few questions? Yeah, and this is this is the last slide. Um, okay, uh, yeah, just to let you know where it's going after this, um, we will incorporate floodplain into uh, other projects that are necessary for uh, geographic specific areas like Johnson Creek Plan District. When we go back to River Plan Northreach, um, the Columbia Corridor is its own thing, and then. Um, how we uh, make changes to South Waterfront Subdistrict is yet to be determined. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic job, staff. This is a big packet for us to read before our next meeting where we have a public testimony. Um, questions from the commissioners for staff? Yes. Yeah, wow. Um, actually, I was just reminded, reminded myself that I did the first Greenway inventory with uh, planning staff 36 years ago before the uh, high school project yes it was a high school project <laughs> and i can tell you that this is infinitely more complicated and thorough than anything we were able to do with hand-drawn maps we did walk every inch of the, the greenway on both sides of the river at that time so i'm really impressed and in fact i want to state publicly how responsive staff has been um, obviously i have a long-standing interest uh, in this issue, and the staff has been very responsive as far as addressing a number of the issues. Uh, they're not completely addressed uh, from my perspective. Uh, there are things like trees. It's not just the tree ratios, but what what kind of replacement trees are required, and if they're too small, they'll just get cut down again. We've had that conversation. We'll continue to. Um, I'm really interested, and I believe, and I see Caitlin Level in the audience uh, from BES, I believe BES actually had a, a formal input to uh, BPS with regard to the setback and recommended uh, 100 feet at that time. Is that still the case? Because um, I know that having participated in Metro's Title III and Title XIII effort, uh, looking at all the functional values of um, streams, rivers, and wetlands, the typical recommendation actually <clears throat> might extend to 250 to 300 feet uh, depending on the functional values you're trying to protect. So uh, given the, the FEMA, the, the National Marine Fisheries um, recommendations on the riparian buffer zone um, at 170 feet, I just don't, and, and, and the vision that was laid out at the beginning of the document, how a 50 foot setback can be reconciled with all the improvements that we keep talking about wanting to see on the, on, on the river. Um, so that's a really fundamental question we have to have, and I'm hoping we'll have 
um, input from BES um, in that regard as well. And I'm wondering, uh, I know Miles Court, for example, was has been inundated more than once. Is there, is the city contemplating, you know, when when there's a repeated flooding of uh, and substantial damage? Um, there there have been, I know, in some cases, provisions for not allowing redevelopment. <clears throat> is the city looking at those sorts of issues? Because we know with climate change, and just looking at that, I don't know how many people were out there in the flood in '96, but all of uh, Willamette Park was under a lot of the buildings in the first story at Heron Point uh, condos, I know were under. Um, I don't know how we're going to really address the issue of resilience if we're building in grandfathering and so forth um, throughout the South Reach. If we're allowing people to redevelop after flooding, doesn't make sense. Well, let's see if we can get a question. Yeah, if we don't have a, <laughs> That's a um, statement. Are there other questions? Katie. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could keep us up to date on the Oregon Marine Board and perhaps we should be writing a letter or something. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it took us years to get the Marine Board to agree to put in a no wake zone from the Oregon Yacht Club to the mouth of the lagoon at Ross Island and the lagoon itself. And the Marine Board is funded by fees from motorized craft for the most part. So you can see where the, the priority is there. So I'm hopeful that the city with all of these recommendations is um, actively engaged in that process. If I could um, just add that I, I didn't say this earlier, but I was asked and I am participating on the rule advisory committee. So certainly be happy to give updates on the progress of, of that committee. Thank you. Jeff. One quick question. The tree regulations proposed for the South Reach, will they supersede or replace tree regulations in Title 11 and Title 33, or will they be on top of those existing tree regulations? Let's see. Uh, so where we apply environmental zones, they supersede Title 11. There are some cases where Title 11 plays a role in our environmental zones, but basically the river, or the river environmental will have its own regulations um, that would need to be abided by. Great. It, it might be helpful, just a suggestion when you're actually writing the code to kind of be explicit as to, you know, these regulations replace whatever they're replacing or supersede just because I know we now have tree regulations in so many places throughout the code, it, it, it can sometimes get confusing. Yeah. And I'll just interject that it's really critical that we do have a stricter regulations, especially in the riparian zone. And there's a there's an area from near the River Forum to Willamette Park that's ver it's been denuded. There are two mature trees. Um, it's ridiculous. And they're, yeah. they're and I would just, every year. So the requirements of the river overlay zone are significantly more stringent than Title 11. Title 11 um, generally starts at trees that are 12 inches diameter. And so we're proposing, especially specifically for the riverbank, that one and a half inches diameter. Yeah. Daisy? I have a question around um, houseless, houseless folks. You mentioned there's something in the plan about supporting coordination with the Joint Office of Homelessness. I was just wondering if you had more details or what that would look like. And then my second question, I guess, is around engaging indigenous communities and knowledge around this plan. Um, so I'm curious, like beyond the programmatic and the archeological stuff, um, how are we incorporating indigenous knowledge in terms of like resiliency and more of the environmental stuff, which I'm not an expert on at all. Um, of course, if they wish to participate and how will we um, continue collaborating with them in the implementation of this? Great, all, all really good questions. Um, so first on houselessness, um, it's such a difficult issue because we know it's um, there's many Related, it's, it's a human services issue. It's 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 something that. Um, so how this plan relates again is one action that that would call for. So for example, parks and rec staff at a park or a natural area, um, or environmental services staff if they're out in the field, that kind of thing. That if they see um, a situation where it looks like help might be needed they could then contact the county office and try to hook up the services to 
to the situation. Um, you know, there also may be cases where um, the public use of parks and things, people may not feel safe. And I don't know, again, it's a tough issue to have to address. But again, that coordination with that county office and appropriate services is what we're pretty much recommending here. Um, your second question was on, oh, okay. So um, there already is, an, um, the city bureaus are already engaging with um, the urban native community especially, but um, with some of the Northwest tribes on projects and programs, for example, at parks and natural areas and things like that. So I think that an ongoing relationship in terms of of um, again the natural environment and things that are important culturally and what have you will continue that relationship is building right now between the city and the urban native community and, uh, and others um, so i think that this plan endorses that and and seeks to for that to continue and specifically as it relates to parks and natural areas in um, the south reach thank you any more questions well hopefully that'd be great Steph yes. uh, thank you you mentioned um, thank you all um, uh, you mentioned uh, that they uh, reevaluating a new flood plan that uh, that brings in the idea of climate change is beyond the capacity of the city of Portland um, could you d just talk a little bit what do you imagine the timeline for that might be I mean there's I mean, this week we are seeing a flooding, you know, our cousins in Umatilla and Pendleton floods happen in their own time. So I'm curious what the timeline is. Yeah, and I, I unfortunately don't have any timelines from in terms of a modeling standpoint of actually the hydrologic and hydraulic models for the Willamette and the Columbia. We're working closely with the Corps and, and BES is, is constantly trying to, to update our data on those matters. We know some general data on what we expect from sea level rise and in one place in particular where we have a work plan to, to do that sort of modeling on Johnson Creek as restoration projects are moving forward in the near term in the next five years that we would be able to hopefully update at least the floodplain for Johnson Creek to address um, climate change and the changes in that in that area. But in terms of a citywide, there's also the Levy Ready project, which is uh, on the Columbia, and that affects things too. We're essentially trying to get a, a model and uh, a regulatory structure in place that when we have new maps from FEMA, that we would be able to adjust it and, and have um, a much uh, a better grasp of, of protections and, and um, development in those areas. Thank you. Let's get one more comment and then other qu other questions let's send by email to staff so we can get to the next topic. But if you'd like to share something, introduce yes. yourself, please. Thank Hi, you. Hi, I'm Caitlin Lovell with the Bureau of Environmental Services, and I have literally hours old um, information to share on that very question. So sorry, Ethan. <laughs> it's flooding um, right now. No, okay. um, the Corps of Engineers does have a model for the lower Willamette River, but it's been embargoed because it's part of international negotiations on the Columbia River Treaty. So we have not been able to access it. We've actually engaged Senator Merkley um, and the highest ranking civilians uh, within the Corps to try to access that. However, we are working collaboratively collaboratively with them to get the information that we can get to develop our own uh, planning level model. So this would not go into actually remapping the floodplain per FEMA's requirements, but it would at least give us a sense of, especially with climate change coming and with the dam operations. So part of this is we have zero understanding and, and ability to regulate dam operations, how that plays into the flows that we expect to see. So uh, the Corps has actually just gone in this week with a funding request for this modeling in the Willamette River uh, for next year's federal fiscal budget and asked for our support. So we're hoping to accelerate the timeline and get some more certainty. Thank you very much. And this is, Thank I you. have to say, I, this is the, a topic that I think we ne we're gonna need to spend a decent amount of time on um, in, the, in our work session. I would like to see this kind of conversation uh, planned into that um, work session. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I know some of you may be here to speak on the expanding opportunities for affordable housing. So thanks for joining our meeting. Before that, we'll invite staff up, um, Phil, Laura, and Sandra, to talk about DOZA. And we're going to finish up some loose ends on some threshold questions and then go to context. And then about 3 o'clock, we'll be switching over to expanding opportunities for affordable housing. So if you're here to speak on that, I think you can get a form to sign up for. Um, but right now, as we switch over to DOZA, I'd like to 
read our disclosure, dis, disclosures. Dis, our displeasure? No. <laughs> um, okay. While it's not clear that the, whether the proposed changes create a conflict, a potential conflict of interest for PSC members because the changes affect such a broad class of property owners in the interest of transparency, we have the following declarations. Commissioner Smith owns property in the design overlay zone. Commissioners Schultz, Spivak, and Bortolazzo work for architectural or development firms who conduct work in Portland. And with that, I think I'll turn things over to Phil and Laura. And if people want to get some food, this is a great time. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Do you want to go ahead and do the thresholds discussion now? Are you ready to do that? Okay. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Laura Lillard with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and I'm joined by Phil Namany, uh, also with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And as you mentioned, um, we do want to spend um, about 10 minutes at the beginning of this um, discussion to wrap up the conversation about thresholds, um, which took place uh, January 28th. And I'm going to go ahead and let Phil lead that discussion. And I know some folks are up uh, getting getting their snacks, but uh, if you do have the spreadsheet from uh, the 28th, uh, that's great. If not, uh, it was basically the last page, and I actually have hard copies if people just need it. It was just the last three items there that we did not get to uh, by the conclusion of the work session last time. Yes. It's got 128. It's got, one, it's, well, it's got the 128 date on it. Right. And so uh, the things we didn't get to are on page five of five. We also have it on the screen as well. It's uh, items 38, 39, and 40. Um, does anybody need a hard copy or? Do you want it? Apparently we do. Okay. I printed it off the, the on the screen. Okay, yeah, we're good. All right. Thank you very much for putting on the screen. That helps. So yeah, if you recall, we kind of finished with talking about some of the, the factors that are reviewed during design review, and there were several things about that, and, and we'll, we'll be back uh, with the list of amendments on that. So I want to start with item 38. Uh, and this was uh, a question where we're revising the, under the uh, modifications uh, that people can ask for and, and, uh, and how they better meet the, the requirements. One of the, one of the provisions that we had put in the code was that uh, that uh, there may you know the modification can be granted if there's mitigation that may or may not be provided um, that uh, um, lessens the impact of the of the item being modified uh, and Commissioner uh, Schultz was wanting to change the the language to say that mitigation may be required. Um, we were pushing back a little bit on that because generally the, the approval criteria that we have for, for land use reviews and or for, um, for modifications to, through land use reviews are usually written from the point of view of the applicant. And that was how we wrote this. Uh, let me get to the page. If you have your volume two, um, that's, another, that's where the language actually is written. Um, and it's on, uh, let's see, it's page eight. It's under page uh, 139, um, and and so there's two criteria that have to be met to, to be able to grant the modification. Um, and the first one is that the resulting development better meets the applicable design guidelines, and the second one, which is under purpose of the standard, uh, it says that on balance, the proposal with or without mitigation will be consistent with the purpose of the standard. And the idea is that's from the, the point of view of the applicant, that the applicant chose either that through mitigation, that they are still meeting the purpose of the standard uh, or consistent with the purpose of the standard, or uh, maybe they don't feel they need to do mitigation. But I, we wrote it that way because it does kind of come in from it's part of the argument that the applicant makes as part of their land use review. Uh, now, the hearing, the hearing body could require mitigation, but that's because they, pro they may not necessarily agree with what the applicant proposed. And then that would be a condition of approval if that was the case. So we were we were that, wanting to push back to not say that it's the review body that requires the mitigation, but that um, mitigation may or may not be provided, and it's part of the discussion. Yeah, 
Um, perhaps I'm not completely following um, the... Well, let me just say what my intent was. What my intent was, and maybe this is all covered, um, is what I, my, in my, this due to my experience, is that sometimes design commission requests and gets modifi mitigation or modifications, you know, um, and sometimes they don't. So I guess I'm just trying to allow for the fact that they may not think and the, the difference, I guess, here where I'm hesitating is the word mitigation versus like a, I guess it's just a little subjective what exactly mitigation may or may not mean. Maybe that's where I'm getting hung up here a little bit. Well, and we, we borrowed the language from um, the adjustment criteria because it's the adjustment criteria that, that this is mimicking. In other words, somebody going through design review can also ask for an adjustment as part of the design review, or they can ask for modifications as part of the design review. So the modification is being driven by the applicant. Correct. So now, and so and so then to to get the modification granted, it's the applicant is making the argument. And so the the approval criteria that they're trying to get is that the proposal with or without mitigation will be consistent with the purpose of the standard. And so it's possible that the approval criteria will say, we think you need mitigation to, to meet that criteria. But this is, this is, comes, this is done is from the viewpoint of the applicant submitting the, the land use review. Uh, I'll, I'll try to restate this one more time and then we don't need to belabor this. Um, I guess what I'm, if I'm following this correctly, um, um, it's the it's the last sentence. Proposals with one or with one mod, with more than one modification will provide mitigation to the extent practical to address the cumulative impacts resulting from modifying more than one standard. Um, perhaps. Often the approach is when you're asking for a modification, you mod you are presenting an argument that the reason you're modifying it is because it's better met or equally achieved by the base standards mm -hmm. or what's being required. And I don't know that I would say that that's necessarily, and, and like I said, maybe this is word parsing mitigation and that there's a cum cumulative impact thing necessarily where this pretty much says you have to address the cumulative impact. So that's maybe where my hang up a little bit is, is that each one in of itself could solve for a, an issue that you're trying to get modified, an item that you're trying to get modified, and they may be completely satisfactory. But this then leads me to believe there's kind of this other thing in addition to each of those items that now I got to look at it in a different way. So that's, and then what does that mean to address cumulative impacts? So it's it's pretty open ended, and it's really like, as an applicant, like I don't know what you mean by that. That's where I was confused. And we we did borrow even that language that got borrowed from the adjustment criteria, and so there's some similar language um, for adjustment criteria that if there's multiple adjustments being asked for, that the um, the review look at the cumulative impact on that, and that and that steps are taken to mitigate for that cumulative impact. The thing with the adjustment criteria that's a little bit different is there's also the aspect that, uh, for example, if somebody isn't going through design review, they're just asking for an adjustment for setbacks and height and building coverage. They're kind of saying they want to make sure that the cumulative impact is not that you're getting a more intense, what would be, say, a, you know, a higher intensity mixed multi-dwelling development type structure in a lower intensity multi-dwelling so that if it doesn't have the, the cumulative impacts or not, that it create like a more dense zone. But the language that we pulled from here is is very similar to the language that was in the adjustment criteria. Um, I mean, we could kind of bring that information, I don't know if it would help bring it to that, to the three by three to see if there's another way of wording it. I mean, no, I, I, like I, said, I don't, items I don't need to belabor it and I can certainly let this go. I. 
just because it's in the adjustment language doesn't mean the adjustment language is good. So that's where I would parse back at you. Like, great, I understand that. And I know it's in the adjustment language too. What I think is just not very helpful is what does one do with the sentence uh, of cumulative impacts? And I, I get where you're going, but it's pretty nebulous and not very helpful to an applicant. That's all. Can I just have have one clarifying question to your um, um, quandary, I guess, with that last sentence. Proposals with more than one modification. Um, here it says will provide mitigation to the extent practical. Um, is the question that it may not be necessary to provide mitigation um, if more than one modification is being sought? If no. it better meets no. the standard, no. It's okay. the cumulative impacts. It's the to the extent practical to address cumulative impacts. So, so again, if I'm addressing, let's say I have three modifications. One is valet parking. One is some, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, something about dumpsters. I'm making sure. up stuff, right? You know, like kind of. The, and cumulative, then, so what is the impacts cumulative impact need to be that? related to each other. Like, um, I just don't know what you mean by it. That's sure. what I'm getting at. Like what. What would so I got three modifications. Mm -hmm. What's the cumulative impact? And and you're telling me that I ha that if I'm reading this that you have to provide mitig mitigation for the cumulative impact. But I don't understand what that might be or how to address. I it. think all well, this is a discretionary review, so I'll, there would be discretion in in that to a certain extent. But I think there's there are a range of things you could. If somebody was asking for for a modification to their ground floor window. To their um, to their front door entry relationship and to uh, to some other um, you know setback front setback piece, all of those potentially impact the relationship, say between the sidewalk public realm and the pedestrian experience and the front of the building. So there may have to be some. They may have to propose you know more landscaping or a plaza or something that, like that that would that would mitigate for the fact that they're possibly creating a blank wall right up to the, against the street. If they're asking for a mitigation, if they're asking for modification to bike parking, uh, a parking space size that's slightly smaller than required and yeah, location of the dumpster on the site, though that, that might not have a cumulative impact. So there might not be necessarily mitigation to, to address a cumulative impact, there may be some mitigation to address where the dumpster is going. Which is, I guess, yeah. just why I was qualifying it, is that design review may have you, or you may need to address cumulative impacts. Mm -hmm. Just because you have multiple modification doesn't mean you have cumulative impacts. And therefore, it doesn't mean I have to provide mitigation for cumulative impacts. Is, well, well mm -hmm. if we changed will to may, to may yeah, is there, <laughs> that might I guess that's, I that think that's what I was suggesting. That is, or, I'm wondering. Yeah. Or, or just get rid of it. With more than one related modification or something okay. like that. I mean, okay. If you just put May, then suddenly the whole rest of the sentence is irrelevant. I mean, Do we need the second sentence? Cat's persuaded me. We don't need it. Mm. But Phil persuaded me that there's some situations where it does make sense. Yeah. The commission can go there without the second sentence. That's true. It makes well, more sense yeah. when the modifications are related to each other. But... Um, so we could come back with language that for clarifies. I, I mean, I think we know what you're getting at. If they're completely unrelated, there's no cumulative impact to something that has to do with the roof and something that has to do with the ground floor necessarily. Absolutely. But I would also say they could all be related. Sure. And they could all have been addressed individually sure. and mitigated. Mm -hmm. Right. And therefore, the cumulative effect is mitigated. Doesn't so you may exist. not have to actually have mitigation for the right. cumulative. I mean, that's where I'm like... Okay. This just seems like it, you're putting a requirement that you have to mitigate a cumulative okay. effect where that's all. Okay. I think we understand it better. Um, so we'll continue to work on this um, and you'll see it in the list of amendments. Okay. Thank you. With wetland fills, I would say required. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's not designed to Okay. Um, go to let's go to the next one, which are ones I suggest, and I think I might be able to make these short work of these. Okay. Um, do you want to, um, page 147, this is really a question I was posing. Um, it currently shows, and under current rules, I didn't realize this, the PSC, the HLC, or the DC can initiate quasi-judicial zoning map amendments. And that has not happened since I've served on this body. So I'm just curious if it's ever happened, whether we want to preserve that power to initiate quasi-judicial amendments. 
Yeah, and I'm not sure from a quasi-judicial standpoint if it's ever actually been invoked. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I sent an email to you just before this yeah. session to your question. I think generally if, if somebody's going to establish or do a large-scale expansion or establish a new design district or, or a historic district, it's, it's going to likely be part of a legislative project, which would be then... Um, 855. Yeah, that's the second, next one. Which is yeah. the second one, um, which then basically those do generally go through the Planning and Sustainability Commission uh, mm -hmm. to approve whatever code changes are needed and, and map changes. Uh, the, we were essentially the reason why we were taking the quasi judicial piece and taking the Design Commission out of the idea of initiating amendments concerning design districts was partially because we've actually pulled away from from establishing design districts as a way of achieving the design overlay zones. We've been actually through like the mixed use plan, uh, mixed use zones and through other um, plan area, we generally have just been applying the design overlay zone without necessarily establishing a design district. Um, so we were just sort of taking that out as, as a bit of a cleanup. Um, mm -hmm. And then we didn't want to touch the, the provision about Landmarks Commission because that wasn't really the scope of the DOZA project. That helps me. I'm, I'm based on that. I'm happy with drawing number 140. Let's see, number 39. I guess that suggestion. We retain. Now we know we can initiate this if we'd like to at some point. And for number 40, um, this was news to me that when a when there's a legislative update, including those introduced by the Historic Landmarks Commission, we are apparently supposed to be a recommending body in the, in the situation, which I had somehow thought that we were not. So thanks for clarifying that. And I'm okay continuing being a recommending body on that. So um, I am- And this is about zoning map amendments, because that's the right. chapter we're on. So I think the Planning Commission is always sort of the recommending body for the, for the map amendments. Okay, so if a, a new historic district is proposed, we would be in the loop on that then I'm not gonna propose that item either. And ready to move to context. Okay, that's great. Um, so let me just... Before we start on the context, I also have hard copies of the spreadsheet that uh, Julie sent out. I know for some people it's hard to print out on 11 by 17, uh, so that's always something. And then for those, we're, we're probably gonna be toggling quite a bit between the spreadsheet and the actual standard. Uh, so if you have volume two uh, of the proposed draft, great. If not, I actually printed the excerpt for the context design standards and I can hand that out if people need it. Okay, so start with number, you'll see on several of these we have consent recommended. So starting on C1, that was a recommended consent with a three by three follow up related to corner features of buildings. So, and I guess the question we have for you, it depends on how much time you want to spend. Um, essentially, let me get my, my, my sheet here. Um, we had a conversation with the standards working group uh, back on, uh, in January. I think we started on the 3rd and then finished it up on the 16th. And, uh, and went through all the, the amendments that have been proposed uh, with the standards working group. And the standards working group you know, made some additional changes, uh, made a, some additional suggestions, and then also kind of determined whether, which things they thought should be on the consent list in front of the larger PSC body for moving forward with, uh, with amendments, and which potentially need to be under further discussion. Uh, so the items on the spreadsheet that are shaded were the items that were proposed to be for um, elected to have further discussion here at the, at the full PSC. That said, if, if folks are interested in any of the other uh, context standards and wanted to pull those off and, and discuss, we could do that. Uh, we currently only have um, the ones that were suggested for discussion were C4, the grouping of trees, um, some of the items related to kind of uh, uh, building history and adjacency to landmarks, so C9, C10, and a possible new one, which I put as C10A. And then uh, 
There were two standards specifically related to the river overlay zone, which I think you guys heard with the River South Reach conversation. Uh, they're they're make, proposing some changes to the guidelines, but we are proposing to put some standards uh, because the areas along Macadam and then the D overlay in the South Reach uh, would be subject to the city the design standards in 420. So. Uh, we've been working with them and they had a couple suggestions for two additional stand, uh, context standards related to the river overlay. And since those were new, uh, we did discuss those with the uh, standards working group, but we wanted to bring those two to the uh, full group. Those potentially six items and we could jump right to the shaded ones if you want. And if there are any that you wanna pull, um, we can do those at the end. Does that make sense? Fantastic, thank okay. you. Um, so let's start with C4. This is um, about the grouping of trees. Um, and Phil, you want to go over kind of what? Yeah, so our, here? and if you've got volume two, it's on page uh, 39, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so we had proposed uh, uh, a bonus or a two points uh, granted for providing five evergreen trees in, in a group. And basically the way we, we categorize that is that no tree could be more than 15 feet apart from another tree. Uh, at the standards working group, there was a sense that there be, might be a better way of determining uh, a grouping of trees or measuring of uh, whether it's a tree density or perhaps coming up with an area um, that where, where the trees should go in uh, because the sense was uh, the way it's written currently is that you could potentially just put five evergreen trees each 15 feet apart and call it a grouping when it's really just a uh, possibly a tree screening uh, along an area. So uh, that was something uh, we haven't come up with the solution yet, but we will be working on that. But uh, we were curious if there was any other conversations or, or uh, suggestions. Well, the, the point of this is in the eastern pattern area, it's the groves of Doug fir that are, are deemed to be significant. Um, during the conversation we had, I, I'm still curious to see whether arborists have weighed in on this um, because I don't know that, I, I'm not qualified to say it should be 15 feet or 25 feet or in what pattern. So that's the, that's the catch. It's really difficult to imagine how to describe that unless it was, well, even if you said it was a formulated a grove of trees, what does that mean? So, I don't know, we kind of punted. Yeah, Janet? Refresh my memory, but um, I somewhat remember thinking perhaps it's a discussion of a certain number of trees per square foot, like per size lot, sorry, maybe not square foot. Right. And then you could plant trees that might be at a healthier spacing or, I, I guess yeah. a part of the also the concern was you might plant your five trees know that they're too close together and you know that a couple are going to die and mm -hmm. so be it you know what I mean so versus let's just try to make sure we plant them in a way that's that makes the most sense that is healthy for the tree back to the arborist comment right yes. the one question I'd like to check with with the PSC on something like that is um, the way it was presented with whether it's you know we just do five trees or it's five trees within a 750 square foot or 1,000 square foot area, uh, that's that's a set and amount, and you'd get the two points whether you did that on a 10,000 square foot lot or a 40,000 square foot lot. Um, the the one concern I'd have with having maybe a tree density per site, because this is this is also intended to be for sort of replacing the groves of trees that have been getting lost by potentially planting more trees, and I don't necessarily if we had a two acre site just to get two points if we did it as you have to meet a certain density for your whole site I don't want to necessarily say well this lot gets two points for planting five trees and this larger lot has to plant 25 trees to get the same two points I don't know if the PSC would feel that that's an issue or not but I, w I was thinking of more having kind of a set area Katie yeah, could you just, um, I mean, I'm not quite understanding. Is this existing trees or is this like planting? This trees? is new trees. New trees. New trees. Oh. Mm -hmm. The idea is because we are losing some groves of trees um, and also because generally the development 
or some of the, the, the ideas for, for development on some of these lots preclude sometimes the ability to actually preserve the trees is by planting maybe another new grove of trees that in 20 years mm -hmm. you'll have something that, that starts to replicate what we had before. Uh, the other thing in conjunction with the Better Housing by Design project, since they're going to be pushing for larger rear setbacks, then there's an opportunity potentially to also plant a grove of trees in that larger rear setback. They didn't just push for it, we just passed it, right? Um, I would comment that I think having language that gets some area for the trees was important because I could imagine someone putting five foot setback, they just put a tree just in the five foot setback along the side of a building. Right. It would never be anything close to a grove. So having some thickness to it, which is handled in other parts of the code, would be helpful to achieve the goal. Any other? Well, just, yeah, just a thought. Oh, I mean, say I got Ben here for a second. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I think some level of proportionality that relates to the size of the of the sites makes sense, because otherwise you could either maybe overburden a small site or over or go on the other end on a large site. I think some some sort of relationship to the site makes sense. Okay, Mike. Well, when I think about again getting into mitigation, you, usually you want in kind on site is the preferred first step. Well, avoidance is the first step. Um, and I don't know if it's possible to write to have language that you would basically duplicate the the structure of those five or ten or whatever. You're trying to you're trying to get back that a lost feature, which is a grove of Douglas firs, primarily in the East County. Is there some way you can just say that the distribution, the number and distribution of trees, has to mimic or duplicate um, what the resource is being lost. And you know how large a Douglas fir is gonna be at maturity, and any arborist can tell you what the distance ought to be to reproduce that grove. <laughs> I don't know how else I, to do it. I did it. notice that if for forestry practices, they actually plant trees as close as eight by eight, 10 by 10. Um, but that's that's for a completely different purpose. That's for growing trees that they're yeah, gonna right. harvest. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. So, I, and we don't necessarily have to, we don't expect resolution on this one today. We just wanted to make sure that this was the right direction and particularly about the proportionality of site size. So it sounds like um, you were okay with um, relating it to site size. Is that um, is that shared among commissioners? Because we can come back with. Yeah, and I, I would think it would need to be inspected, right? I mean, those kinds of things don't just... Well, which it would show up on the landscape right. plan, so yeah. then they would have to... Because, um, you know, because it really would be, and I, I think you should use the word grove. The other, the other possibility mm. would be, okay. since they get two points, and if we came up with some sort of an area, would we be, do we, and if, it's a, if they have a bigger site, do we want them to have to do a, a, a larger planning to get the same number of points, or would be amenable to them planning two little groves of trees and getting four points as an example. I'm not it. hearing a lot of people jump on that yeah, one. Okay. Um, well. So two points is a pretty decent earnings and I guess we'll look at the balance of the points later on. But that's right. Um, I think if it's okay for now, we suggest having scaling based on site size, keep the two points. And, uh, and are we going to get a list of the points and we, uh, kind of a all at one time kind of? Um, yes. At our next meeting, discussion. we're going to summarize all the stuff that we straw polled on. That's right. And have a little discussion on a few items to give more direction so that those going to three by three can take it all with them in one clump or one grove. <laughs> Very funny. Okay. okay. Let's go to the next one. The next one is C9. And this one, um, we kind of went back and forth on. This is kind of a you either love it or you hate it. Um, and so I think where we landed was keep it, but let's just let the, give the discussion to the full PSC. Um, this is one of the few standards that relate specifically to context, um, uh, neighborhood context and site context, um, with a caveat that if it's done well, um, which is hard to um, quantify. So um, this one is about relating um, or installing a plaque, a uh, building or site history plaque. Um, if a site contains a building that is at least 50 years old, installing a, pack, a plaque, excuse me, on a street-facing facade 
um, that provides information on the previous uses of the building or site, um, and the plaque must be at least two square feet in area. So you want to sum up the kind of points of contention on the, this? Well, I think there, were, there was a mixture of this should be dropped or mm -hmm. some people liked it. And then I think the, the conclusion from the working group was potentially at least putting uh, or, or trying to put a little more specificity about the makeup of the plaque as far as, if, you know, that it's not just a piece of cardboard that's thumbtacked out of the mm -hmm. building, but, you know, whether it's made out of certain material or, or you know, permanently affixed or something along those lines. I think there was a, a desire to have something a little bit more specific about how that plaque is, is what it's made of potentially and, and how it's mounted. So if we're going to require it, make it for, for real. Right. right. Thoughts? Well, Kat. No doubt. It's a, I, it, I agree. It's a very easy point to get. But I was a proponent of this one, thinking of two different places I've visited, where, and Walla Walla is a lovely little town. That's one of them. You walk around the neighborhood, and it's just this gorgeous little neighborhood and here and there there's these plaques and it's really interesting to walk and learn about the neighborhood. Um, so I guess to me, I was like, it'd be nice to be able to do that in some parts of Portland and whether it's interesting architecture or interesting history or, I mean, it can be so many different things. I was also a proponent for the plaques being consistent in their look so that as you're walking, you're keying into something that you're kind of used to seen it kept it's like oh that's one of those plaques i'm going to stop so i'll leave it at that ben also agree that uh, it may look like an easy point to get on the surface but i i, I do think it it creates it helps um determining um you know a, a connection to to history even though if it's maybe a, you know a 51 year old building uh, it kind of reminds me of my hometown where you know you see plaques here and there napoleon <laughs> slept here here you know 18 19 1969 yeah um but it does it, it it's an, an item of interest and i do think we need to put perhaps put some boundaries on on making sure that this is made on durable materials maybe there is a list that includes you know concrete stone metal uh, and you know, exclude cardboard, cardboard, uh, and 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 you know, uh, attach with you know, permanent fastening. Any other thoughts on this? Well, just well, the design. You know, it seems like if there was this kind of a standard design, I mean, I could even see like a shape, like you were talking about, and cat, and um, and then maybe some way to personalize it by neighborhood up on top you know a little symbol or something so you know when you're in a certain neighborhood you'd have that little i don't know i could just almost see that other examples in portland of signs like this that people have imagined in their mind this would be a great not maybe as a prescriptive thing but just as an image so that someone who's looking there could say oh yeah like that a role model sign are you asking? I, I'm asking the question, if, do you guys have something in your head or a picture somewhere that uh, from Portland? I've seen signs on buildings in Portland, but I just... There is a, a recent one that I've seen. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but that just went up on Sandy Boulevard. Um, it's a blank wall condition, and it does talk about the historic Sandy Trail. Um, and there's a map that kind of shows how that connected um, the, you know, to the river. Um, and I think it's metal fastened on a concrete wall definitely going to stay there um, and it's very legible okay. I was someone who was in the camp of this is an easy point let's not give it um, but I am I think that I'm fine having it in there um, and the caveat would be that if we start running a sample on these projects and someone can easily do this point instead of something else which people think is more important then that could raise the issue of people if people figure out how to do almost nothing related to the buildings nearby mm -hmm. by just getting some random few points here and there and this being one of them then i'd be less generous with that um, so i guess i'm going to recommend that we keep this in here and provide some language about the material type and durability <coughs> does that seem consistent with what people think yeah i was a naysayer as well for the same reasons and yeah i'd want to see it is sub something really substantive Okay. Is that enough direction for staff? It is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next one is C10. Um, and there are a couple of um, different 
issues related to this uh, series of points. This is uh, one of those hybrid standards in that um, it is required, um, but there's a, a range of options to meet the requirement. And so this is um, related to context for buildings that are um, located adjacent to historic landmarks. And I will let Phil walk through this one. And this is actually a good one to compare what we have here in the in the amendment suggestions to the the uh, actual um, standard that was in the table, because uh, as as Laura mentioned, it was a hybrid one. We uh, if, if a building was adjacent to a historic landmark, um, it was required to, to choose one of the bullet items. There were six listed, and then you could uh, choose additional bullet points to up to a maximum of three points. Uh, so in other words, if you uh, you could potentially choose one of the items and then choose two or three additional depending on the number of points and get uh, get another three points. Uh, the original uh, uh, requirement was that it did not re uh, apply if your new building was adjacent to a landmark to a, uh, was adjacent to a landmark building that only contained residential uh, uses. Part of that was because of the range of residential landmarks that may be next door to this. Sometimes we might have a, an old house that's in a commercial uh, corridor. Uh, and I, I don't know that we were necessarily wanting to require a new commercial mixed use building to somehow mimic what had been a historic home uh, in those cases. And so that was kind of the idea before, behind that. Um, sometimes you may have an apartment building but might be set back a ways from the street. So those were kind of things we were, we were thinking about initially. Um, the uh, this, the uh, the options of those six options were a range of things, uh, uh, some of which were a little harder to meet than others, and so when we talked about this with the uh, standards working group, um, there was some clarification that was uh, provided on on that uh, for the first bullet point. Um, they, there was a sense that. Uh, um, for the street facing ground floor where we say it's either tall as tall as the ground floor window, which there's a little typo in there. Um, the idea was that, that uh, potentially it be as tall as it as the ground floor window, the adjacent uh, landmark or at least 10 feet um, to kind of have the option to make sure that you at least get enough height. Uh, it'd probably be whatever is more uh, on that. And then uh, in addition, um, I think that was actually the only real change. Uh, the last bullet should have the term at least. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so the last bullet um, talks about the portion of the new building must be set back. And this is where just adding the phrase at yeah. least 10 feet from the property line. So yeah, that's right. I was I was thinking the 10 foot had to do with the, uh, the ground floor. Yeah. So the idea being that that it's not exactly 10 feet, but that it's a minimum of 10 feet back from the landmark uh, for the part of the building that goes beyond the landmark. Uh, then the other the other provision that was proposed was uh, there was a, definitely a lot of discussion about the fact that although residential buildings do have a variety of uh, types, that in some cases it may still be desirable for the new building to borrow some features from a residential landmark building. And so the proposal was to, pinch, to potentially borrow some of the items here from C10 and create a new, it would be a C11, but, and then we'll renumber everything. But there would be another optional standard for if you're building adjacent to a residential landmark or a historical landmark that is a residential building that you can gain a couple points for potentially using similar materials or using a similar window uh, uh, proportions or th things like that. Uh, and so that's that's something we still have to write up, but uh, we wanted to bring that back to the full commission because it is a, sort of an expansion of, of of the provisions, but it does add another opportunity to meet a context uh, standard. Yeah. So just in summary, um, the tweaks to C10 aren't aren't huge, um, but C10 is still only related to commercial buildings. And so the thought with the standards working group was, well. Um, Historic landmark buildings that are residential are still important, and so is there something that we can say about the relationship to those? So we would then borrow some of these, but not all, because they're not all relevant, and create a new standard. Um, so we just wanted to check in with you all that that is a good direction um, on both of those counts. The tweaks to the original 
that would affect commercial historic landmark adjacencies, and then just borrowing some of the bullet points for um, buildings, new buildings that are adjacent to historic landmarks that are residential. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, I've got one question on, because I always forget this, List adjacent to a historic landmark, is that always a building or is it sometimes a district? How is that uh, defined? It's defi historic landmark is a building. Yeah, so okay. a historic district is a separate. They're all considered under the, the umbrella of historic resources, but a landmark is, a, is it may not necessarily a building. A historic landmark could be a, a statue potentially, okay. but I don't know that we have many of those. <laughs> you match um, the height. Yeah. Um, and so a historic district is is a separate piece, and a historic district could have some landmarks in it. Okay. It also has contributing and non-contributing structures. Okay, but this would be the landmarks in the district. It would not be the contributing so if structures. You're, if you're adjacent to a historic district and that, that building at the edge of the historic district was a contributing structure, uh, this would not apply. Understood. Thank you. Kat? Just minor thing. Wouldn't have thought of it, Phil, until you just gave that explanation. Perhaps we need to clarify historic landmark structure then for item one, because you're right. What if it is adjacent to a site that contains a historic landmark statue, statue. Mm -hmm. or tree or um, the standard is OK. We could put the word building in there. And I think it's clarify. just your first sentence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just can't hurt to clarify. Agreed. <laughs> Any other questions on this before? Yes. I'm just curious, what is uh, what is the purpose of a 10-foot setback or more? And I guess I asked, like, having lived in New York City, like, some of my favorite historic landmarks are, like, abutted by hyper-modern and, like, seeing the contrast between those buildings, you know, uh, I think heightens the context and, like, the specialness of a building. So that's my question. And if you want to answer that one. Yeah, I'm reading. And this is related to the last bullet. Yeah. Is that right? I'm just, I'm wrapping my head around it so I can best answer your question. She, um, she was on vacation for. I know. <laughs> I'm still in Mexico. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, I can soft shoe for a second then. Um, like, <laughs> like coming in when you yeah, come in from the you. Staten Island Ferry and there's mm -hmm. these two huge skyscrapers and then there's like the two story, has anyone ever seen this? Like there, there's the church, the old church and it's just <laughs> glorious. I, I'll make perhaps a response to this yep. is that um, you were required to do one of the bullet items on this list. That's so you correct. Couldn't, or, but if you you can get points for doing additional ones. So one way to think of it is that you would be perhaps in that if you want to build a, um, a very modern building next to an old building, then you would pick another one of the bullets to meet, and you would not get those two points, um, unless anyway. You, I think the idea was you're kind of it, it by stepping it down to the landmark. It's you're sort of in deference to the landmark a little bit, um, and and that was I think. That's right. This sort is of the idea behind that. Something that comes out of discussions with um, landmarks commission when they're um, or design commission when they're reviewing new buildings that are adjacent to historic landmarks, especially that just want to sort of um, not overimpose um, the landmark and just kind of make sure that that's um, still a feature and a highlight of the street or context that it's in. Did you have something else to add? Well, quickly, you just said step down. This is about a step back, which right. is different. Um, what I was just going to say is I find, I personally agree with you, Steph. Um, Portland's Landmark Commission doesn't on a, a typical review basis. <laughs> it doesn't mean there aren't some commissioners that maybe have that point of view. Um, and I guess going back to my thought about trying to make sure the standards align with approval once they go to a review body, kind of being in sync is important. And I, I do know that's a very important element to this, to our Landmarks Commission. So I'd leave it at that, as much as I also don't agree. Thanks, sure. Thank you. OK. Um, Are there any other any questions other on C10 or? C10 mm -hmm. or, the, or the new 10A? OK. okay. Um, let's move on, and I'm not going to scroll through the um, proposed draft because the next ones are actually new. 
Um, so for these, you will refer to the table. Um, so C13 is a um, proposed new standard, um, and this came out of discussions with the Southreach uh, team. And Phil, you want to go ahead and explain C13? And I think we also may have Cassie Ballou here who also helped with this. Uh, she's a member of the, she's been actually working for both uh, on the DOZA team and with the River, agent. River <laughs> Southreach team. Um, and so they've, the, this came out of uh, some public discussions uh, with stakeholders on the, uh, that are involved in the River Southreach. And one of the things that was being looked at is the fact that actually currently areas along McAdam um, that especially those that do residential development um, and layers along McAdam can also go all the way out to the river as far as the D overlay. Uh, they have the ability to use standards. And so this was, uh, the sense was in, kind of in keeping with trying to create some standards that also work together with our potential future guidelines uh, that they address kind of some specific contextual responses uh, for the area. And for this area, it's uh, the big feature is, is the river setback and the greenway trail along the Willamette, Willamette and how that um, interacts with development there along there. And so there's, there's two standards that are being proposed to be added. Uh, and these are being proposed in a very similar way to some of our other context standards where potentially uh, they may have to meet one or two of them, and then they might get points for meeting additional ones. Uh, but this first one is both a, a, a kind of a combination of creating a building interest along the river uh, through the use of some massing requirements uh, and possibly some uh, facade uh, articulation, as well as potentially uh, requiring or providing bonus depending on how many of these they meet uh, for, for providing balconies, uh, potentially providing a provision that uh, there be ground floor windows for the buildings that are close to the river setback uh, and some other uh, glazing requirements. And then uh, the fifth item here is, is potentially requiring at least one tenant space uh, or residential lobby entrance that would then f be on that building face that faces the river. So. We haven't actually drafted up the full-on code for this, but uh, those are the. There's basically five things that they're they were suggesting. Uh, I think that that what they were originally proposing is the idea that you have to meet two of them, and you could get additional points if you meet any additional ones. Any well, I'm, on I'm yeah. I'll speak out in favor of of these. I think the neighborhood is very interested in them, and I think that I mean the. <clears throat> the rationale being that walking along the greenway along a major trail is quite a different experience than walking along a street, say on McAdam, mm -hmm. and that these are important issues to address. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where safety comes into this, by the way. I see there's, there's also concern of entrances facing the river and security issues. I'm not sure what that is about. Yeah. yeah, I think that I I I'm guessing asked. that's me. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say I wish I hadn't asked. Oh, I can make it. I can make it quick. I think you've heard me say this many times. It'll <laughs> ring a bell. Okay. There's just some instances when it's actual parks property versus private property. Oh yeah, yeah. And Bing. confusion about who's policing what. That's all. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. I sounds like we're getting some support. Nod your heads. To roll with these, to include these items in the list of context standards. Okay. Okay. Oops. And I think we're at the last one. Mm -hmm. And this is also new C14 on your table, last page. Oh, cat, yes. I just was rereading this. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear about one thing. Reading this sentence isn't quite correct, where it says there's concern about entrances facing the river. There's no concern about entrances. It's direct connection. Hmm. Just FYI. Okay.
Yeah, and I think I think the idea was that some of the conversation we had with that was whether there would be a requirement that there is a free and open access from the the river trail, you know, without any kind of gates or any kind of security, or whether it's okay to have a little fence and have a, a gate to kind of, to delineate between the public property and the private space. And I think that's where the idea of the security concern was. Uh, we're essentially, I think what we're looking at is this idea that the entrances, you know, having them face and having them work within the pedestrian circulation system would ensure that at least the connections are there. And then it, it would be sort of up to the, I think we would leave it up to the property owner. You know, if it's an office building where they expect visitors to use the trail or bike in off the trail, then maybe they'd keep it open during office hours. If it's a, a residential building, potentially there's a, a, a key lock or something along those lines. And I don't know that we're going to dictate one way or the other on that. Yes, Steph. Um, but I do think, uh, I think this assuages at least my my concerns about lack of access to, um, to a major trail, making the access uh, of a gate optional rather than re removing that, um, that this provides options for, uh, for the developer, for the future residents. So I'm, I appreciate the inclusion of that. Okay, shall we go to number C14, proposed new. So this also um, is a uh, uh, one that you could choose to do a, multiple things. Uh, um, and I think what we were looking at was the idea of potentially requiring that uh, it has to do with the outdoor areas and the outdoor areas being adjacent uh, to the uh, the river trail and the, the river setback. Uh, and then having an applicant be able to choose potentially different aspects uh, of the outdoor area, whether it's to um, to include ground floor, you know, have an outdoor area that's more of a plaza that includes a ground floor uh, that has commercial space uh, to potentially use for outdoor seating, or whether it's an outdoor area that has a has some landscaping around it to kind of distinguish from the, from the trail. Uh, but the, uh, the intent is to kind of extend the river setback into the site through an, through the use of their outdoor area. And it's possible that, you know, this outdoor area would also you know, be able to meet certain base zone requirements for outdoor space. Uh, but as you can see, there's, there's a few different options they can do. They basically, the outdoor area either can connect directly to the river front of the trail. Uh, the outdoor area has a, has a, a low screening to delineate it from the uh, river setback. Uh, the outdoor area includes you know, an entrance to ground floor commercial space, uh, which could help activate that outdoor area and the link to the river trail. Uh, and then the other, th the other provision was the idea that uh, the outdoor area be able to be used in all weather. And that was number four, the 15%, uh, that at least 15% outdoor area be covered by awnings. And that was something we had a discussion, I know, about whether that should be a minimum or a maximum. Uh, but the sense was, I, I think, to, to have this opportunity that it can be used in all weather situations. And so I think we, we, we kept the minimum of 15%. Any questions? We got thumbs up around. Okay. Any concerns? Okay. I think we're getting support for that. So that was, unless people want to bring up any of the other C1 through C12. Just a <laughs> clarification on, on, the, on this uh, C14. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> is this uh, assuming that, oh, is it on? Yeah. yeah. yeah is this assuming that uh, uh, we're replacing commercial with active use? I, th I seem to think that that was the suggestion. And if so, I agree with it. That's, yes, that's what's in the... Um, Parenthetical under number three in proposed amendment. Right, that was your intent. Yeah, I think so. The idea would be potentially, yeah, whether it's, uh, I know we have other places where we define active use, whether it's um, residential lobby space or, or things like that. I think that's. Yeah, commercial that's might not there, always yeah. be okay. appropriate. Sounds good. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We're ahead of schedule. We are. Um, so just really quickly. Um, we, 
We're putting all of these loose ends together. Um, you've gone over a lot of amendments. Um, so um, pat yourselves on the back. This has been a lot of work sessions, um, many, many, many line items. Um, we are, as we're calibrating everything that you all have brought up, especially for the standards, we are um, looking to see if there are major disparities between the guidelines and the standards. And we're also looking at points and kind of calibrating all of those. Um, and this will inform the discussion at the three by three. So that's sort of the next steps, just to give you a sense of where that's going. Um, if we think there are major concerns that should be addressed um, prior to the three by three, we will uh, let you let the officers know, and then we can kind of decide whether or not we need to pull the standards working group together. Um, but I think we're in really good shape. Um, so we will be continuing this until February the 25th, where we'll confirm with you all the list the final list of uh, amendments. Thank you. Do I also have to say that, or is that enough? For the <laughs> you should probably should. say it. Yes. Um, we will be continuing this on February 25th, 2020. <laughs> Thank you. And for um, raise your hand if you're on the 3 by 3 Which raises a question. Dates mm -hmm. or a date? So we're, dates. we're looking at early to mid-March. A doodle poll is coming to you oh, shortly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And yes. we're, we're, we're oh, debating okay. whether there are uh, may need to be well, whether we can do everything in one three by three meeting or two three by three meetings uh, just to kind of give you a, a sense of of the number of amendments uh, i don't know what laura has for the guidelines uh, but for uh, for the code amendments we probably have around 80 uh, code amendments some of them i think we've already discussed i don't you know it's it's going to be from there right to Right to us suggesting stuff, and I'm I'm trying to uh, the list that we're going to be going going over on the 25th will delineate between things we think need the three by three conversation, and things where we want to go straight to, you know, we'll just do the amendment and present it at the full PSC at the final work session for the vote. Uh, but I think I there's probably about 25 to 30 things that are showing up as being. Uh, set for the three by three. That said, uh, a lot of them are related. Um, I, this, things like the standards about weather protection, where we probably had four different standards for weather protection. Those were all kind of deferred to discuss at the three by three. So it, it's it's one subject matter, but it'll, it okay. was affecting four standards. So uh, so there'll be a, a fair amount of stuff for for the three by three to work on. Okay, Jeff. I'm only asking this to kill a little time because I... And I don't think we need to go through... I have an idea of how we can make <laughs> pre-headway on this next well, project. Well, I'll ask this next. This ask it anyway. Uh, we had a discussion last time that was... had a lot of input about this question on FAR transfers. And I'm just wondering, you guys were going to go back and do some research. Is that coming back to us at some point or is that a three-by-three three issue? I think... Oh, well, I think, uh, I think Joe and Troy are working on coming up with some background information on the FAR transfers and what the intent okay. was for the central city. Uh, and then we're going to ha definitely have conversations with a three by three on that. And I, I assume also probably a robust conversation with the full PSC before we get a vote. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Kat. I'm, a, I'm sure you're already planning on this, but I... Hearing that you've got we've got that many amendments, would love your guys' first take on we think this should be consent. Not that obviously we can't all pull something, but that might help us. Okay, too. that's good, helpful. Thanks. Great. Thanks. So, thank you very much, thank Phil you. and Laura, for guiding this project. Um, yay! We'll take a. <laughs> what did you say? Okay, so we're going to take a five-minute break, after which staff is going to continue the briefing um, on the expanding opportunities for affordable housing project. We'll start public testimony at 3, but we'll have a little staff input before that. So brief break right now. Thanks.
Before that, we'd like to invite staff to remind us what this code update is all about and get us get us warmed up. Thank you, Eric and Dan. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Ingstrom with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and with me is Nan Stark, uh, who has been the primary staff person on this project. Um, we'll just spend a few minutes before the testimony reminding you what the project is about. And I'll say one, the sorry, I forgot to say the one thing is that I have an initial stack of cards. Julie is assembling additional ones. We'll have two minutes each for testimony, and if you have not already provided a card, please work with Julie to do that. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Um, so Nan, we'll start with just a reminder of what the, the substance of the project involves. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nan Stark. I'm the Northeast District Liaison with VPS, also the project manager on this project. Um, this is a project that Metro funded, uh, has been going on for about a year and a half now. The city applied for that grant because we saw that there was opportunities out there on uh, faith and community-based organization land that potentially could be tapped for development of affordable housing. We were hearing about this from some mission-driven organizations, and we wanted to kind of capture the momentum that was happening. So we applied for that grant. Uh, Metro gave it to us. We've been focusing on streamlining uh, the development process for these particular types of opportunities for creating affordable housing. So a lot of what we did was first look at what the barriers are to uh, developing affordable housing by organizations that typically aren't in the development process. And we identified several barriers. Um, the land use review process is what we're here to talk about today because the regulatory process is one of the bigger barriers that we identified. And um, so that is also one of the potential solutions that we can uh, that we can provide, and that we're here to talk about. So um, we've got a few changes to the zoning code that we're proposing, uh, exemptions to the conditional use review process, because what we found was one of the biggest barriers to development by. Uh, community-based organizations was the conditional use review process. Typically that's a type 3 review, meaning that a staff uh, makes a recommendation to the hearings officer, there's a public hearing. It's a fairly extensive and expensive process. Um, so streamlining the review process is, is one of the proposals that we're making specifically for the development of housing on conditional use sites. So we're proposing that when housing is proposed on a conditional use site, that it be exempt from the conditional use review. Um, and then there's a few other less, uh, well, not exactly minor, but um, going along with that exemption would be um, if there's a change to the conditional use site boundary if uh, an organization wants to redevelop up to 50% of their parking area for housing and also um, to increase uh, floor area of any kind of up to 2,000 square feet. So those are the basic amendments that we're proposing. They're found in three different um, chapters of the zoning code, but they're really about the conditional use review process. Um, and then the other thing to note is that in cases where a um, organization would not be able to qualify for that exemption, because in order to qualify for it, you have to meet all your conditions of approval and you have to meet all of the development standards that are applicable to the project. If you can't meet those, then we're also proposing to reduce the review threshold for these projects to a type two review which is a staff decision. It's a much less expensive and a much shorter um, review process. In addition to the zoning code amendments, we're also proposing some zoning map amendments. Uh, we initially proposed map amendments on 11 sites around the city. And um, several of those are faith-based organizations. A few of those are other uh, community-based organizations, 
And uh, since the testimony period for this proposed draft came out on January 2nd, we've received another 11 requests for zone changes. So after the testimony, we can um, talk about those and go into detail if you need to. So the project timeline, where we're at, um, the testimony period for the proposed draft that we're in right now started January 2nd, so it's been about six weeks. If we are able to uh, come to a decision today, then we'll be on track for the recommended draft to come out next month. If, it do, if, if, you're not, if you don't have time to make the decision today, uh, the next hearing or the next um, uh, time that we have on, on the PSC agenda is March 10th, so a month from now, and um, then you would do your deliberation and vote. Uh, we have a tentative city council date of April 1st. We're still trying to be on track for that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric for um, a little bit more information, and then we can start testimony. There's a few. Turn this on. Uh, there's a few housekeeping things I wanted to mention about the proposed draft. Um, first, and I may have mentioned this in our last briefing, um, since the initial proposed draft on January 2nd came out, we revised some explanatory language on page two of the report, and that section is a, is the description of um, how how we modified it based on the previous draft, and the Housing Bureau had asked us to modify some of our explanations, and so the, the online version of the report um, was updated about a week after January 2nd, and um, I believe we have inserted all those those changes into the paper copies and if, if you all have paper copies that you didn't get today from an earlier period um, we can get you a substitute version with that page two language so when you actually make your motion to move this on to City Council we should mention that in the motion that that you're moving the as amended report as well um, a second um, housekeeping issue is that after we issued the proposed draft, but before you vo are going to vote, the um, Better Housing by Design project will have um, either gone into effect or at least been approved, and, and it is past the appeal period now, so it will go into effect. So we want you to authorize us to convert all of the zoning proposals, um, for example, the R2 or R1 changes, to the new equivalent that was approved with the Better Housing by Design project. So that would be the RM1 or RM2. And there's a, a, a fairly straightforward conversion there. So we just need to build that into the language of your approval uh, with your permission so that we don't have to individually review all those with you. Um, a third item was um, one of the sites uh, on Northeast Killingsworth, I believe, um, uh, was in a real estate transaction to be purchased by a community-based organization um, as we move through this project, and it was in your proposal in the proposal. Um, it's our understanding that that transaction has stopped, um, and so we um, are asking to remove that site from the um, from the draft. And which that, that's that, the Hacienda site on, on Killingsworth 74th, and Seventy Fourth. Mm -hmm. um, so because that's not yet in a community-based organization's hands. Uh, we don't want to, it's beyond the scope to just hand out zone changes um, to the existing property owner. So we're trying to target these changes to uh, sites that are in the hands of community organizations who can execute um, housing. So those are the three things. We, As Nan mentioned, we had a number of new map changes in the, in the testimony period. Uh, we've examined those and have a recommendation on those. Um, in the interest of time, I think we should get the testimony done first before we go into the details of that. But as Nan said, there are 11 of them. Um, for the most part, we agree with them. There's a few that we'll want to flag for you. Um, the uh, There's also a number of code change proposals that have either come in through um, Commissioner suggestions, which you all will talk about, as well as um, a few uh, amendment requests from the Bureau of Development Services on some of the details, uh, and we'll go into that when we get into the deliberation. Um, again, I don't want to eat up too much time right now going over that, but um, before we get into the testimony, are there any clarifying questions about the code proposals um, 
before we jump into the testimony. Use this opportunity to um, ask if any commissioners have any conflicts or items to note. Uh, Is this okay doing this before the time, certain time? Yes, thank you. After talking to the city attorney's office, I don't believe I have an actual conflict. But nevertheless, I do work. I represent one of the churches that's asking for some changes today. So when they're up, it's Mount Scott Church of God. I'll just step down and, and not just as a matter of appearance, not be up here when they're speaking. But uh, so that's that's my non-conflict conflict. conflict. <laughs> And I have one of those as well. Um, I have been in discussions with one of the congregations here, um, Trinity Lutheran, and um, I don't believe it's a real conflict of interest because we have no agreement between us, but I will similarly <coughs> recuse myself from any discussion on that and in that situation pass the mic to Steph Rao. Anyone else have on the commission? Okay. Kat. I don't have a conflict, but I do have a, just looking at the time, do have a question if you want to take any questions before three or do you want to do, what's your plan of attack here if it's a clarifying question i think that's fine we, we just didn't want to get into eating up a bunch of time on amendment ideas yet just in the interest of getting the testimony out of the way um it, you can tell me if it's better to pump this uh, there was a fair amount of testimony with regards to removing all part or making um the provision for 100 percent of the parking to be able to re redevelop do you want to or at some point, could you address staff's position on why it's at 50%? Sure. Um, yeah, I think I mean, that you can do it now or later, that however you think it's appropriate. There are a number of, of ideas around the issue of the parking. The, the code, as it is worded now, allows up to 50% of the required parking to be removed for, the, for housing development on one of these conditional use sites. And typically, um, the required parking got there through a conditional use review um, where there was a, a review of the operations of the institution and the, and the development and, and the decision was to say there should be a certain number of parking spaces. So what we're doing here is modifying that those past agreements to say you can remove up to 50%. Um, there is, I believe, uh, some thinking about why not 100%, um, which will be discussed when we talk about the amendments. Um, and there are... Um, we, we will pass out a, a write-up of language for some of these. That The ones we were aware of, we prepared code language for. There may be a few that weren't caught in here. Um, the two, I think the two things that come up in talking about the parking just in terms of the code interaction is um, that same section of code also requires um, you to comply with past conditions of approval. Um, and so... Um, there's a give and take between the, the complying. It, typically, the parking is one of those conditions of approval. So we, we're trying to work that conflict out, the fact that, that we may be imposing conditions that are then undone by this. Um, and then the other one is that um, we haven't proposed with this project to rethink the conditional use process vis-a-vis -vis parking. Um, that's sort of beyond the scope that we set out to do in this project. and. Um, so if we were really doing that, we might revisit the, the, the approval criteria for conditional uses overall, um, which we did not do here. We, we were just looking at carving out a, an exception process for um, expediting housing. Um, so uh, again, we'll get into the staff recommendations later, but there is an issue um, with the parking one just in the terms of how it relates to the um, unraveling previous conditions and and it, it brings up the question of, well, why have those conditional use criterion to begin with if we're going to waive them immediately in another section of the code? Thank you very much. Well, I think we're at 3 o'clock. Um, Nan, do you have one minute? Yeah. Yeah. Just one more thing I forgot to mention is that um, in the room with us today, we have staff from uh, Bureau of Development Services and uh, Bureau of Transportation. So they'll be available after testimony if you have questions of them. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we have a full room. Thank you everyone for turning out on an afternoon where the sun's actually outside. Um, I've got 32 cards here. We'll be doing two minutes each. If you multiply that out, we're using up a large chunk of our time. Um, so if someone says something that's already been, if someone's 
already said something that you want to say, please feel free to reference back to the prior speaker. Um, and I'd like to start off to see if anyone there who in the room has health issues or mobility or children that would make it beneficial to speak first. Okay, the first three people I have on the list are Keith Edwards. And come on up, please. Um, Doug Klotz and Martin Elfert. And after them will be Julia Metz. I'm sorry about my name reading here. Leisha Posey and Brian Tread. And when you speak, please start off with your name and we'll get the two minute clock going and we'll start off. So first, Keith Edwards, please. Is either of you Keith Edwards? No. Okay. <laughs> then we will move forward to Doug Klotz. Hi, uh, and my name is Doug Klotz. Um, I support the uh, expanding opportunities for affordable housing graft. Uh, which this is an obvious step to take with these uh, institutions that want to build housing and this will remove regulatory barriers um, and allow that to happen. Um, the good thing that we talked about uh, the 50% versus 100% because that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, we, I think that we should be allowing community-based or uh, faith-based organizations to remove 100% of their parking places. Um, and I know this, this contravenes the conditions that are in place, but so does the 50 percent that's proposed. I mean, you're, going to, you're changing them one way or the other. So, um, <clears throat> and if, if that means we should be really looking at the conditional use process, um, maybe that should be part of the process. Maybe not. It's, it sounds like we need to get this in place, but I would support 100 percent removal um, when it's near transit or when it's not near transit. Um, you know, the, 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 the nearness of transit is people walk a lot further than the specs on that thing on that anyway i mean 500 it's i think it's 500 feet and i walked that twice that to get to the bus myself so um so i would i would support everything and i support all the amendments that i know about and probably the others too um but uh, anyway i support the the, the uh, proposal with removal of all parking requirements thank you very much keith is that you, Keith Edwards? Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Like to... Thank you. And you're welcome to testify next. Okay. Well, thank you again for allowing me to testify here. Um, uh, my name is Keith Edwards. I'm a member of Bethel uh, Miami Church. Um, our organization is, a, is Bethel EDC, Economic Development Corporation. And what we do is housing. We do also um, a food <coughs> program for our community as well as education. Um, we're planning on uh, building a building. We have a, a two lot area on Northeast Jarrett Street, 802 and 814 Northeast Jarrett. Um, those lots are owned by the EDC and we want to develop those and we want to have affordable housing. Um, 12 units of affordable housing <clears throat> on that particular piece of property. We um, had an opportunity to um, do some good work with the um, benefit of a grant to get us prepared for this. But, um, and we got a lot of good help uh, from um, Nan Stark with the city, as well as Bill Hart and Sharon Nielsen. Our challenge though is that, um, of course, the financial end of it, um, as well as the uh, zoning uh, concerns that we have. And so we're hoping that the amendments will be ratified as well um, because that will increase our area uh, 25 percent and allow us to um, build and be able to uh, benefit the community. Our proposal in, um, in, on this property in uh, building the housing units is that we make sure that um, we don't have second and third generation folks that are um, also utilizing affordable housing. So we're going to have a program that allows them and supports them in making sure that the next generation will not be in the same predicament that they are in in regards to affordable housing. Um, with that, I would thank you and um, hope that you will um, uh, follow the um, amendments. Thank you very much. Martin? 
Hi, my name is Martin Elford. I'm the rector or senior pastor at Grace Memorial Episcopal Church, and I'm here looking fabulous in red in solidarity with uh, the folks who are uh, want to see these amendments happen. And I'm here in particular because for a lot of years, Grace has been a uh, home for the arts, for service to folks with disabilities, and for service to the poor. And uh, we've been a place, in other words, that's uh, a center of faith in the broadest and most generous sense of that word. And we've got a vision for expanding that by partnering with Northwest Housing Alternatives with uh, our sister organization, Grace Institute, who put on Grace Art Camp. Many of you will know that. Mm -hmm. And by partnering with um, a FAME, who work with developmentally atypical adults to build an art center and affordable housing on our block in northeast Portland near the Lloyd Center. Uh, in the vision, the new campus is going to be an extraordinary place of creativity and beauty and home. Even more than right now, we envision the Grace Block being somewhere where people find healing, belonging, and meaning. And so we need your help to make this dream come true. Uh, in particular, we're asking you to consider rezoning the Grace's Block. And if I know my new designations right, I think CM M3 is what we are hoping for. Uh, my colleague Trell Anderson from NHA is going to talk specifically uh, about that, and I'll uh, let him tell you about specifics. Uh, this change is going to allow Grace to still more fully do what we've been doing for a lot of years, uh, which is serving our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. My daughter is and my son are both Grace Arts Camp attendees and love it. Come on. And I'll say for future people, if you could mention the location of your, if you're talking about a specific property, because I don't know where all these congregations are located, um, that'd be great. Thank you very much. So Julia, Lisha, and Brian, and the next three people will be Stuart, Dana, sorry, Stuart Schmaltz, Dana Krautzuk, and Terry Jones. So Miss Julia, yes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Julia Metz, and I'm a housing developer with Catholic Charities of Oregon. Uh, Catholic Charities has been engaged in and following this project since its inception, and we are in support of the proposed draft. Additionally, some of our project partners, including the St. Philip Neri Parish, uh, have submitted written testimony in support of the plan as well. Uh, while we foresee citywide opportunities through the plan, today I'd like to focus on one particular site. Since last year, Catholic Charities has been discussing affordable housing opportunities in partnership with St. Philip Neri Parish, which is in Lad's edition, uh, and it is, uh, which is one of also one of the sites proposed for rezone. The site currently hosts a variety of parish uses and buildings, including what is affectionately referred to as the old church, as well as the rectory. Our goal, uh, if financially feasible, is to restore and repurpose these two buildings and add a new complementary building along the vision to support new affordable housing and related uses, as well as ongoing parish activities. Just this past Sunday, we held a public open house to share early conceptual site plans. Uh, we received a variety of feedback, uh, and it was exciting to hear from a great number of attendees voicing support for affordable housing on the parish property. However, the site is currently zoned R5, which even with the anticipated changes through the residential infill project, uh, would not support the number of units typically needed to make a project financially feasible. The proposed R1 or RM2 zones uh, provides the necessary economies of scale for affordable housing while being responsive to nearby zoning. Based on our studies thus far, the rezone would allow us to have approximately 57 affordable homes and supportive services on site. Uh, our, tes um, our testimony and the attached document provides more details as well. If this plan goes through as proposed, it could easily reduce the development time to provide affordable housing at this location by a year or more and reduce costs to pursue uncertain processes. This means more affordable homes will be available sooner and less expensively with the, with the recommendations of this draft. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alicia, yes. is that right? Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Leisha Posey, and I am the former co-chair of the North by Northeast Community Development Initiative Oversight Committee for Prosper Portland. This committee is charged with the oversight of the North and Northeast Community Development Action Plan. I am also the engagement and program lead for the Empowered Communities Program housed in the Bureau of Development Services. I'm here today to talk about a property located at 4515 
North Mississippi, and I am in testifying in support of Diane Clay, who is the property owner. I met Ms. Clay through my work with the Bureau of Development Services. In an effort to support Ms. Clay's goals for creating generational wealth and counteracting displacement, I am asking the Planning and Sustainability Commission to consider Ms. Clay's request for changing her property zone to commercial or multi-dwelling. This zone change will align with her property with her pro this zone change will align her property with much of the rest of Mississippi Avenue and allow her more options in the future. To that point, Ms. Clay's property is adjacent to the zoning that is proposed or matches comp plan designation. Ms. Clay's business and property is another strategy to restore community back into the landscape into uh, north and northeast Portland. In doing so, she is providing benefit to the community with her innovative business model of providing affordable and culturally responsive housing. Ms. Clay has a vision and a mission. Her story is one shared by many Black people in, North, in Northeast Portland. It is one of disenfranchisement, predatory lending, displacement, struggle, and legacy. She is simply seeking to create generational wealth for her and her family and creating a legacy. She has chosen real estate as the means to do so. Please support, support her vision by allowing her property to be included uh, in this proposal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Brian? Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, giving me a chance to speak. Uh, my name is Brian Terrett. I'm the Director of Public Relations and Communications for Legacy Health. I'm also the staff lead for Legacy Health on the Williams and Russell project. If you don't know, in August of 2017, Legacy Health came together with the City of Portland and Prosper Portland and announced uh, that Legacy uh, would be willing to donate the land at the corner of Russell and Williams between, between Vancouver and Williams and Russell and Knott um, in order to have that property developed uh, to honor the history of African Americans in Portland and to create opportunities for economic growth as well as provide uh, health care opportunities uh, in that area. Uh, as a part of that project, we uh, were able to work together with the community to develop a project working group. The Williams and Russell Project Working Group has been meeting since, uh, since uh, December of 2017 and have been working towards developing a plan. We recently heard about these cha zone changes and it was suggested that the property um, that is in question uh, would be a, a good opportunity for us uh, to have it rezoned, specifically to support the effort that people are looking at doing on this property. One of the number one uh, uh, requests from people within the community about what should go on that property is affordable housing. And we feel like this will support that effort to do that. Um, we've submitted a letter uh, as Legacy Health. We've submitted a letter uh, asking for that change. And I'm also here representing the project working group. Uh, they have expressed support for this change as well. And so I would ask uh, that you go ahead and, uh, and support these changes to the code. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Chair. What, one quick, what, what's the change you're asking? Um, it, right now, it's uh, uh, Campus Industrial, and we're asking for it to be changed to uh, uh, CM2, CM3. I thought it was three. I I yes, saw. yes, saw exactly. And I've ad identified in our letter uh, the three specific tax slots uh, that we're looking at changing. Great. Um, thank you, everyone. Next up will be, so Jerry Jones, Dana, and Stuart, and the next three after them will be C.J. Wells, Charles Kelly, and David Brink. So let's start with Stuart. I'm Stuart Schmaltz. I am from Mount Scott Church of God, and I'm the board chair. And thank you all for um, allowing us to come and share, first of all. Um, Mount Scott Church of God, why do we need to do this? We, um, like many churches, are facing declining attendance. We have a building that was put up in the 80s and is old and needs a lot of repairs. We have... Um, a new roof needed, we have a parking lot needs maintenance. Plus, we um, want to do church differently than we've done in the past. We um, worked with An Dr. Andrea Cook, if you know her, from Warner Pacific University. She mentored our team through a 10-year uh, vision plan. Uh, that began in 2016. Part of that plan is selling a portion of our property. And one of our goals in selling a portion of our property was to partner with some type of a senior community senior community and we we're very interested in Bridge Meadows, if you're familiar with Bridge Meadows. 
Um, sadly, they, and they actually f partner with foster families and uh, the elderly, so they work in conjunction. We love that model. We didn't work out for us, so we had to move on and uh, go to an 18 lot development, which we then, in the process of all of this, and we're four years into this, we um, had an offer come in last year from somebody that wanted to do a senior care facility. So we're excited. This is memory care, assisted living care. Uh, having dealt with this in my own family, um, lost my father to dementia, so this is near and dear. There's a huge need for memory care in Portland. So we're excited to see how we can move this forward. I have a team here that's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, challenges we've been facing. Uh, I also would like to say that um, Mount Scott Church is committed to doing ministry outside of our walls going forward. We're very committed to working with the homeless out in our area. We're very committed to um, working with a new neighbor to neighbor program that's rolling out actually citywide. We're working with a lot of your city people on how we take care of community members living next door, partnering with neighborhood associations. Uh, trying to talk really fast because I think yeah, we're about out time. here. If you can wrap up, that'd be great. Okay, wrapping up. So we have a buyer, like I've said, and he is ready. To, we've actually got an offer on the table. And our goal is to um, allow these assisted care, memory care people that live normally within a three mile radius of where these they're living now is where they would normally move to. So we're positioned well, in a you. nice place to make this happen. Probably a good handoff there. <laughs> Dana? Good afternoon. Dana Kraftcheck from Stoll Reeves here on behalf of Mount, Church, Mount Scott Church of God. The address is 10630 Southeast Henderson. We submitted testimony on February 4th, so it should be in your packet, and we're one of the 11 that staff mentioned, so there should be a map. We're enthusiastically supportive of this project. Um, as you heard Stuart explain, they're four years into development, and because of the regulatory burdens that this project is supposed to address, we actually see a path forward now, and we couldn't be more delighted. We've got two requests. One is a zone change comp plan amendment from R10 to R7, um, and those meet the guidelines to resolve some split zoning, and it's more compatible with the surrounding area. The second amendment, or second change that we request is a little different than what's in the current package, but is as much of a regulatory burden as the conditional use process that you've intended to address. That's a property line adjustment. The property line adjustment and subdivision processes in the code are complicated, expensive, and create considerable uncertainty for deals. In a church like this that wants to sell a portion of their land, you have to have a unit of land that you can actually sell. That means you have to go through a PLA or a subdivision. The code provisions that you're creating to allow folks <laughs> to modify their CUP boundary without having to go through a discretionary process requires a lot line in the location where you want the boundary moved. So that means that in order for churches or other faith-based groups to take advantage of the, the streamlining you're talking about, they still have to go through a PLA. So they still have a really expensive, burdensome process in front of them. Our solution that works for our project is a request for you to legislatively adjust our property line. It's absolutely within the city's authority. It's frankly much less significant of a change than you're making in a lot of other sections of, of this project. Um, and what it will do is it'll allow this senior housing project to go forward um, months and months sooner and significantly less expensive, just like you heard Catholic Charities say in terms of the, the types We're of- We're gonna need to get the closing on it, thanks. Yeah, the, the types of burdens that this can, can break through, our PLA um, that's within your authority is absolutely necessary. Thank you, Thank you very much. Jerry? Thank you for allowing me to speak mm -hmm. today. I, I just wanna quickly say that I am supportive of the EOAH, and I believe my colleagues have basically hit all the points, so I wanna save that, but uh, maybe just reiterate that by you guys passing this today will de definitely undoubtedly unlock a lot of development potential and streamline process, save a lot of costs. So appreciate your time and consideration on this. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. And, Thank you. and your name for the record? Yeah. It was Jerry Jones. Okay. The next three will be C.T. Wells, Charles Kelly, and David Brink. And after them, Diane Clay, Leon Porter, and Andy Goble. I'd like to ask Andrew Clark, can you come up? Uh, no, 
You good? Okay. Is one of you CJ or CT? I'm CT. CT. Oh, CT. Thank you. Sorry. CT, CT. Wells. Okay. Uh, Senior Pastor Emanuel Church, 1033 North Sumner, here in Portland, Oregon. Thank you for uh, receiving us this, this afternoon. We're here to speak about a project that we're calling the Conquering Health and Wholeness Center that was focused on early childhood education, housing primarily, early childhood education, health and wellness, and uh, wealth cre recovery. Um, and so for 32 years, Emmanuel Church has been uh, in the North Northeast Portland area, has been a, a stalwart in terms of community activism, outreach beyond the walls of the church. We had a project called the Renaissance Market, which employed 32 people. It was the only black owned full-fledged grocery department store in the country. Andrew Young came and celebrated the work we've done. My father, Bishop A.A. A. Wells, had been noted for uh, the work that he had done in the city, and the church continues that work. And so over the years since 1988, uh, we've had a number of as many as 32 different programs and projects that the church has undergone. What we look at now, and others have mentioned, we have the adjacent property, the parking lot, to the church and the adjacent property across the street that housed the former church that we uh, took that structure down. And now we're envisioning uh, developing something uh, on those two parcels of property that speak to housing in our, our neighborhoods, uh, early childhood education, wealth creation, and health recovery. The reason we focus on these health, we're recognizing that many of the members of our church, many of the people in our ch community were burning out our kidneys because we don't have proper health management. There is a need beyond what we typically, we appreciate all that's gone on in terms of our uh, health industries, but we recognize that we need to go a step further. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of people in my church, the church I pastor, that have chronic health conditions. So we're concerned about that. We're also concerned about how we educate our children. So we've outlined a pretty ambitious vision. And we believe that we're going to need some zone uh, considerations and other considerations that will allow us uh, to develop these properties. Also, and I'll end with this, that uh, as has been mentioned, churches are facing major challenges. We've got to reinvent how we do ministry, that the churches can no longer be supported based on tithes and offerings and speak to the needs that are in our community. So we have to be creative about how we remain missional and yet help the people in our community. So we hope that we can count on the support uh, as we in, in, in advance this endeavor. Thank you very much. I don't want to hear from Charles at this time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charles Kelly. I'm an architect and urban designer at ZGF Architects, and ZGF Architects fully supports this, um, um, this great work. Um, we are also been assisting uh, Mandel Church for the last year, helping that community understand what are the services that are needed um, that they can build that supports um, those who are in need and need that help. And part of our initial study was to recognize that the zoning on the land really um, is, has two limitations. The one limitation is that for this vision for the health and or the, the center of whole, health and wholeness is that they need to have the opportunity for both nonprofit and for-profit health services to be occupied on the site and work in concert with the community goals or the community needs um, uh, in the area and, and regionally um, because they serve a regional uh, catchment of folks who've been displaced to other anchor areas around the community. So in that, it's a little bit more complex. That means that it's R2.5 right now. They really need to go to like a CM um, zone, and I th we think that um, that's an important thing that we need to front in our ask. The other uh, piece is that the um, zone, um, current zone, uh, has a height limit that will restrict the amount of uh, housing that they can build and with these facilities that serve um, the health goal for the project. And so they need to have, and they're, because they're right on the freeway, uh, we ask you to consider having them uh, um, have a CM3 for the height. Now, recognizing that this is a neighborhood and that community has a, a role and fit, and they've been very careful to be fitting in with the neighborhood, I think our ask is that you consider um, a, a, our a CM2 and with a pathway to 65 feet 
next to the freeway so that we have the flexibility to meet everyone's goal on this site and give um, meaning and purpose to their goals and to the neighborhood goals and try and make a proper fit. So CM3 for height, CM2 for use. We'd like to work that out with you all and the neighborhood when it's time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, David Brink, again, I'll set this aside for later. If anyone's come in who has um, children or accommodations they need, just let Julie know and we can slip you in. Um, next will be Diane Clay, Leon Porter, and Andy Goebel. And after them, Medina Glenn, Elvia, Ginelli, Carazanza, Valadares, I'm not saying this very well, and Charles Cunard. So, Diane. Yes, hi. Yes, thank you. So, hi, my name is Diane Clay. I'm with Clay Property Management, and I'm here to request the zoning change from residential to multifamily at the property of address at 4515 North Mississippi Avenue. As you heard earlier from the testimony of Ms. Posey, I'm requesting that change because I pride myself in being affordable housing for low income and working class Portlanders. With that being said, I've been in the neighborhood for over 30 years. That house has been owned in my family, and that will be, be able to create generational wealth, not only be able to provide affordable housing for people that's been displaced, that's been living in that neighborhood all their life. So, um, and that pretty much sums it up. So my request today is asking to change the zoning from residential to multifamily and, um, in that area and the, um, and that's pretty much it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Leon. Hi. Hi. I'm Leon Porter, and I submitted the written testimony for Portland Neighbors Welcome, but today I'll testify just as an individual. Um, I support the proposed draft, but I am concerned that it only allows 4% of parking spaces to be removed by right outside a very narrow band around the frequent transit corridors. And that restrictive rule will still obstruct most community-based organizations in the city from replacing their parking lots with housing. So uh, it's really important to amend the proposal to allow at least 50% and preferably 100% of parking spaces to be removed by right, um, even outside those uh, transit corridors. Please also make sure that you set up the rules to facilitate interim use of community-based organization land for homeless navigation centers and transitional shelter villages, as well as housing. Um, for example, Oregon Harbor of Hope is planning to partner with religious institutions to use their parking lots as sites for navigation centers similar to the one under the Broadway Bridge and we need to help them do that as easily as possible. Uh, a lot of the testimony you've received uh, consists of requests for narrow targeted up zones of individual properties, but we need to make it easier in general for community-based organizations to obtain further targeted up zones as needed in the future after this proposal has passed. So please consider delegating authority to the Bureau of Development Services to approve targeted upzoning requests through a streamlined type two procedure and uh, waive fees and reviews by partner bureaus. That's all, thanks. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Andy Goble and I am one of the pastors at Portsmouth Union Church in North Portland. I also manage the North Portland Winter Shelter for Do Good Multnomah. So I have those two roles. As a church, Portsmouth Union has been working on building 20 units of affordable housing on our church property for the last five years. And that entire time we've hosted severe weather sheltering and now we host a nightly overnight shelter um, in our church uh, in our sanctuary. Every morning when I go onto the church property, I see two realities. The first reality is the faces of 50, up to 50 folks experiencing houselessness who I look in the eyes every morning before I send them back out onto the street for their day. And the other reality that I see is an empty lot that's been sitting next to the church building. It's been empty and ready for uh, housing units since we tore down a third of our building back in August of 2018. 
a significant reason why we still don't have housing built on that property is the burden of the land use process that we had to go through. A number of other speed bumps along the way and outright barriers that we've had to push through up until now. But a big one has been the land use process. So I personally support these proposed code changes because when our city is in a state of emergency when it comes to houselessness in our city, five years is too long for faith communities to have to wait to see folks moved off the floors of our sanctuaries and into permanent supportive housing that so many of us are ready and willing to build. I also support these changes because I'm also, our church is a part of the Levin Land and Housing Coalition, and we want to see other faith communities do this work, and your code changes, the changes that you approve, will make that possible for so many of us. Thank you for doing that work. Thank you very much. Yes, Kat. Just real quickly, I think I missed it. What was the address of your church? Portsmouth Union Church is at 4775 North Lombard. Thank you so much. I wish I had known that off the top of my head, but thank you. Okay, next will be Medina, Elvia, and Charles Cunard. And then after them will be David Groff, Anthony Bloker, and Reverend Lynn Smoos Lopez. So first, Medina. Hello everyone, my name is Medina Glenn and I'm a member of the St. Philip the Deacon Episcopal Church in Northeast Portland on 120 Northeast Knot. And I'm part of the Levin Land and Housing Coalition as well. I'd like to share my story and why I and many others support code and zoning changes proposed by BPS to allow faith communities to build affordable housing on their land. From 2014 to 2016, I went through three no-cause evictions in North and Northeast Portland. I had no choice but to be pushed out and burned through what little savings I had from earning a preschool teacher wage. I would be on the streets now if I wasn't privileged to have a family with resources. I have seen and met many who are not as privileged as I am, who are barely surviving in our city. At St. Philip, in a community that has deep historical roots, I have heard many stories of being pushed out and made to feel unwelcome in the place that they cultivated and built. Reverend Alcina Boozer, former rector at St. Philip and a pillar in our community, recently talked about walking down North Williams Avenue and being sneered at. As folks at St. Philip continue to age, many talk about the days when Elliot was a strong African-American neighborhood, a vital presence in the city. We ask, how can we alleviate this housing crisis and stand firm in our commitment to this place? St. Philip and this interfaith coalition can help uplift this city through affordable housing and other services. If we are given the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Elvia? Hi, um, my name is Elvia Janeli Carranza Valladares and I'm a student at Warner Pacific University, as well as a community organizer at Loving Community and part of the Land and Housing Coalition. Through the work that we do, we have continuously heard and continue to hear the voices of those affected by housing, and that is moving us to want to build housing on the land of faith communities. I will be graduating in May, um, and after graduation, I will be moving to Woodburn away from my friends and family because I cannot afford to live here anymore. Growing up, I've also experienced moving from apartment to hotel room to different friends' couches because we could not afford to find a place to live. So now, moving is not um, just something that's happening, it's also part of my story now and th things that I grew up doing. Uh, my story and voice is one of many that joins the narrative of those affected by housing injustice in Portland. Our voices today are only a fraction of those that need to be heard. I bring in my heart the students from my university our school motto is in the city for the city, but many of our students are not able to afford to be in the city after they graduate. My best friend, a criminal justice major who spends her time volunteering and being present in the city, is moving to Vancouver because she cannot afford a place to stay. It is because of my family, my friends, and the community that surrounds and supports me every day that I support the code and zoning changes proposed to remove the barriers to afford housing 
to remove the barriers to affordable housing development on faith land. If faith communities get the code and zoning changes, we would be able to build so much housing. We are looking for changes that will stop hindering us from doing good to our neighbor. It is because of those surrounding me that deserve to stay in the city they love, to stay in the city they grew up in, and for those like me who want to stop moving and just stay, that I support the changes proposed today. Thank you very much for coming out. Charles Kinnert. Uh, good afternoon. Charles Kunert representing Trinity Lutheran Church at 5520 Northeast Killingsworth. It's one of the three churches that received the Metro grant. We appreciate that very much. Uh, there, I, I speak in support of these amendments, uh, particularly the issue of the conditional use permit, uh, smoothing that process out or making it easier for people. Uh, we were approached several times by developers to develop uh, our land. We have about six acres uh, for housing that uh, would be McMansions, but we're in the heart of Cully. And Cully doesn't need McMansions, it needs affordable housing. So we made a conscious decision to provide affordable housing in that area, even though we knew we would not generate an, uh, much revenue from that, but it was a part of our mission. And so the uh, initial uh, barrier we faced was the fact that we had several potential developers for affordable housing that we were working with who had very low margins on their projects. And the first, uh, barrier we had was that PBOT was requiring us to extend Northeast Emerson through our property uh, tentatively, con uh, and we would only know for sure what they were going to uh, require based on the conditional use permit process. Well, we couldn't afford the conditional use pro process because the reason we're selling part of our property is we don't have any money. And so the people could not get an estimate from PBOT as to what the actual requirements would be until we had done that process. So in other words, I really support this this uh, move. The other thing is the PLA that somebody else talked about, the property land adjustment, would be to, to us a real big advantage in our particular project. And i just say one final thing. Uh, it occurred to me as I was looking at the emergency in China with the coronavirus that they were able to build a full hospital in 10 days. <laughs> and with the housing crisis we have in Portland, it would seem that maybe we could get creative. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And while well, the next people are coming up, this is David Groff, Anthony Bloker, and, and when we had a housing emergency in 1945 in Portland, we passed the War Housing Act. It was six pages long, and it went through in, in I think, weeks. David. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is David Groff. I'm a, I live in the Woodstock neighborhood in southeast Portland, and I'm a member of West, uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church in northeast Portland, but I'm also the co-chair of the Interfaith Alliance on Poverty, a group of 14 congregations, uh, Catholic, Jewish, and Protestant. Most of them are located in uh, northeast Portland, but four of them are on this side of the river as well. All of our member congregations are acutely aware of the houselessness crisis that our city has been experiencing for some years. We encounter people seeking shelter on our property almost on a daily basis. And we all participate in programs uh, serving the houseless, providing uh, volunteers and financial support. Our faith traditions tell us in no uncertain terms that it should no one should have to live unsheltered and so that is what motivates us in this regard many of the congregations in this city have land as we've been hearing uh, that could be used for affordable housing for that reason and because of our moral concern about those in our community who are already without shelter and those in our community who are on the brink of being without shelter because they can't afford to stay in the housing they have uh, we strongly urge that these changes to the uh, Portland Conditional Zoning Code be uh, done. Uh, we in the faith community want to do our part in addressing the crisis. We only ask that the city facilitate rather than impede our efforts. More specifically, we ask that Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission, you folks, recommend to the city council that they take the following 
uh, actions. Adopt the changes to conditional use review that reduce the amount of time and money faith communities and other CBOs must spend to undertake affordable housing projects. Wave elements of the design review that historically have contributed to gentrification. Include language in the code that faith communities can play a significant part in the city's anti-displacement strategy and expand funding of affordable housing development by small and nonprofit developers. The present Thank crisis you. demands we'll that our city mobilize every available uh, resource to create the affordable housing that we need. Faith communities are ready to help in any way we can, but we need you to support us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anthony? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anthony Bloker. I am a member of the St. John's Wesleyan Church at 8550 North St. Louis Avenue in the St. John's neighborhood of Portland. Um, I'm also a member of the Levin Community Land and Housing Coalition. Um, I support these zone and code changes um, not because of a specific project that my that is it's affecting my church's property at the moment, but rather just because of the moral implications um, and of from my own background and story, which is what I wanted to share with you today. Um, when I was around 14, my parents lost our childhood home to a bankruptcy. Um, what followed after that was a string of moves from rental property to rental property that were invariably sold out from under us by landlords that were seeking profit over people. Um, with little affordable housing available for my barely above poverty level family, uh, we were at the whim of luck and chance often. Um, despite our hardships, I actually feel fortunate. Uh, my family was able to stay in the community that we were in with traditional housing. I know many families and friends that either had to be displaced from the communities, from the community I grew up in, or had to resort to non-traditional housing, rooming with other families or living out of a car or worse. Um, and because of that, they were often severed from the community that was able to support them. Um, the community that supported me the most was actually my church at the time. Um, they helped with moving labor, with food, with all sorts of encouragement, anything else they could do. Uh, there is a huge need for affordable housing in Portland, um, and there's a population of faith communities that are eager to help, and they care deeply about families and their holistic stability, and they're committing to putting people over profit. Uh, my church right now is interested in building affordable housing on land we possess, and we are only one of hundreds that can help. So I support these zoning and coding changes. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Reverend Lopez? Thank you for the opportunity to share. I'm Reverend Lynn Smouse Lopez, and um, I pastor Ainsworth United Church of Christ at 30th and, and Ainsworth in Northeast Portland. We are also part of the Levin Community Land and Housing Coalition. And so I'm calling on you to support the code changes and approve them and the zoning changes. Uh, that are proposed by BPS to remove barriers to affordable housing development. Not only is the whole Levin community gathered to, to look at that, our congregation is looking seriously ahead at how we can help the housing crisis. We have housed the HIV Day Center from Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon for over 20 years. Every day I see people who are houseless that come to the center for community and for food but have no place to go at the night. We house a, an extreme cold weather shelter for those same people that have HIV. Um, but I also need you to support this because I, it's a personal issue for me. After downsizing twice since my husband has retired and we launched our adult children, um, afterwards our son was uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. He tries to hold his, his life together and he works part time as much as he's able. And so we help him with rent. It's affordable, but I'm talking, we need low income housing. His affordable housing, he can pay about half the rent and we pay the rest. And, and so we have to help him and support him. Plus, when he has uh, custody of his daughter every other week, they come and stay with us. Our, our adult daughter also struggles with emotional and mental health issues and currently is home, houseless. She camps outside. 
she gets into shelters and then out and and for two years she's been in outside home houseless she needs housing not only just housing but wraparound support services desperately my husband and i cannot do or provide all that she needs these are just two of so many stories that we see and hear all out in the community and that I see daily at the Day Center. So I ask you, please, help us move us forward to do this. Thank you very much. Yes, Kat. And I'm sorry, gentlemen on the end here, I forget your name. David Groff. David? David. I, I have a, a clarifying question for you. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps it's just technical language, but I want to make sure I understand your testimony. You made a comment about design review contributing to gentrification. Do you mean kind of the land use conditional use review as a part of this these code amendments or something in addition? No. These these amendments. Great. Thank you for clarifying. Right. The next three people will be Jasmine Velez, Mar Marha Selman, Maria McDowell, and after them will be Jason Perk, John Calhoun, and Michelle DePass. So Jasmine, yes. can, thank you, you can begin. Um, buenas tardes, mi nombre es Jasmine Vélez. Good afternoon, my name is Jasmine Vélez. Soy organizadora de colisión y, y tierras de viviendas de Leven. I'm an organizer with Eleven Land and Housing Coalition. Vivo en el área de Culi y quiero contarles un poquito de mi historia. I live in the Culi area and I want to share a bit of my story with you. Yo vivo en una pequeña traila Tengo tres niñas y mi esposo. En total somos cinco. I live in a small trailer. I have three daughters and my husband is there, so we're five in all. Lo más triste de ahora es que mi hermana perdió su vivienda y ahora ella está viviendo con nosotros. The saddest thing right now is that my sister lost her home and now she moved in with us. En total son cinco niños y tres adultos. Los niños son de diferentes edades. So in total now, there are five children of many different ages and three adults. Es muy difícil vivir en un pequeño espacio. It's very difficult to live in such a small space. Para mí es difícil levantar a mis niñas uh, temprano para que puedan usar el baño y todos tengan acceso. For me, it's difficult to get my kids up so early so that everybody has access to the bathroom. Es muy frustrante para mí. Esa situación. The situation is very frustrating for me. Y cuando los niños más grandes quieren hacer tarea, los when, niños más pequeños quieren jugar. When the older kids want to do their homework, the younger kids just want to play. Y eso se vuelve un caos, una frustración para mí. And that just becomes chaotic and a frustration for me. ¿Cómo po puedo decirle a un niño que no corra, que no juegue, que no grite? How can I say to a small child, don't run, don't play, don't yell? Por mi trabajo en la colisión, estoy escuchando muchas historias de familias. Through my work and with the coalition, I'm hearing lots of other stories from other families. Que están pasando por esta misma situación. Who are going through the same situation. Las viviendas son muy caras. Housing is so expensive. Los apartamentos, hay una larga lista de espera. There's a long waiting list to get into an apartment. Es difícil poder agarrar un apartamento. It's really difficult to be able to get into an apartment. Lo bueno que hay congregaciones que quieren construir viviendas accesibles. The good news is that there are congregations who want to, um, to build affordable housing. Yo apoyo los cambios de los códigos. I support these code changes que PBS está proponiendo that PPS is, is proposing para que las congregaciones construyan viviendas accesibles so that these congregations can build affordable housing. Sé que existen barreras. I know that there are obstacles. Pero tengo fe en los cambios de los códigos. But I have faith that these code changes para que muchas familias como la mía puedan tener un espacio digno mean that families, including mine, can have a dignified space. Y los niños puedan tener suficiente espacio para poder jugar. And that the children can have sufficient space to be able to play. Gracias. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Maria? 
Hi, I'm Maria Selman. I'm a member of First Emanuel Lutheran Church in Northwest Portland um, on the corner of 19th and Irving. Uh, we have been looking at building affordable housing on our property for probably seven years now. Um, we live in a neighborhood that is rich in resources and transportation. We house um, the Rose Haven Women's Day Shelter. And so every day we see the desperate need of our neighbors for a place to live. Um, every morning, uh, as people arrive at church, we have to ask people to pack up and move on from where they have found a corner somewhere on the property to sleep overnight. And instead of that kind of housing for people, we'd like to build proper housing, um, fully supported in our neighborhood. We've discovered that there are many hurdles to doing so. Some of them are financial, many of them are bureaucratic, and the worst is when the two come together. Um, and it costs a lot of money to figure out how to get through the bureaucracy. Um, for many churches, that is the biggest part of the hurdle, is to figure out how to get through that first part when you don't necessarily have the supportive money of a developer for the project. And so removing some of the barriers through the conditional use process will be really helpful to faith communities like ours in getting through those initial financial and bureaucratic steps that will allow us to get on with getting our projects done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Marha? My name is Maria McDowell. <clears throat> I'm the rector of St. Philip the Deacon Episcopal Church at 120 Northeast Knott Street. Um, and I, while I speak, I would actually like to invite the Levin, uh, Levin Land and Housing Coalition folks to please stand. Uh, we'd like you to see how many of us are here and invested um, in this process. Um, I grew up in Portland, uh, but like many, my family is now dispersed all across the city. Um, the 25-minute drive uh, to see one another doesn't seem like a great deal, um, but to my mother's aging body, that amount of time in the car is becoming very problematic. And there are no uh, good senior housing facilities near either my, uh, my home in Cully or my sister, um, who now lives in Milwaukee, uh, which is a great concession to those of us who are very proud of Portland. Um, St. Philip the Deacon is also an aging parish. Um, it was founded by African Americans who were dispersed by city-sponsored development over the course of decades. Now, as they age, they want to come home to be together again. Um, a parishioner, Jerry Caldwell, the brother of the aforementioned Alcina Boozer, um, has actually sold his house in North Portland and moved into Calaroga Heights. And he looks out one window towards uh, the neighborhood that he grew up in to his former house and he sees the Coliseum. He looks out another window um, to the street that he used to walk down and get ice cream um, with his friends after school. He and so many other members of our parish would like to be able to come back um, and have the kind of supportive community that they remembered um, and that supported them as they were children and young adults growing up in that neighborhood. St. Philip has actually tried to build housing no less than two times um, in its history, and each time a combination of money and the review process um, proved too burdensome for them to be able to complete any of those projects. Um, uh, Portland um, is full of uh, growing and developing housing projects, um, but it's, it, it, they tend to be oriented to the young, the able-bodied, um, middle to upper middle income folks. Um, so that does not characterize my congregation. Um, we would like to be able to participate in the kind of um, diverse, culturally responsible housing um, that we see happening around us and that we think that our neighborhood needs. And so we support the proposed changes um, by the, the BDS or BPS. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everyone. Next, we'll have Jason Kirk, John Calhoun, and Michelle DePass. And after them, it'll be Trell Anderson, Tonito Pacifico, and Hope Keller. And we'll start with Jason. Hi, my name is Jason Kirk, and I'm, uh, I attend the Wesley St. John's Wesleyan Church as well as I'm a partner of the Levin Community Housing uh, and Planning Coalition. Uh, I'm a former member of Hazelnut Grove. I was one of the founding members. It started in October 2015, 
At the same time as the housing state of emergency in Portland began, and here it's been almost five years later, and three quarters of a billion dollars spent on houseless issues, and still I see the same thing. Whereas, uh, as part of this coalition, I see a group of people that are one person, like each, each person here represents their own group. Like, so it's not just the people that you see in this room, it's the people that all these people are here speaking on their behalf. As well as, uh, I've seen everything from tents to tiny homes. And so I would suggest and urge that you would uh, change the conditional use zoning so that uh, any kind of thing from uh, affordable housing to tiny house villages uh, to even sleeping pod villages for the houseless can be done on faith land as well as uh, community organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is John Calhoun. I'm here as a member of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, which is located in the Hillsdale neighborhood at the corner of Southwest Sunset Boulevard and Dosh Road. We are one of 20 Presbyterian churches in the city of Portland and part of the 96 church district that comprises the Presbytery of the Cascades. According to our executive presbytery, the Reverend Brian Heron, dozens of our churches across Oregon are looking for ways to ease the affordable housing crisis. This is a priority for our presbytery that we have available property and a deep mission to serve those most vulnerable in our communities. St. Andrews is interested in converting a section of our parking lot that is no longer fully used to land that can be used to build workforce or low income housing. We know that the amendments under discussion were developed to assist us in this process. However, we are disappointed that the current version is not particularly helpful in our case. The provision to grant up to 50% conversion of a parking area if it is within 500 feet of a bus stop with no more than 20 minutes between buses during rush hour is unnecessarily restrictive. Our location is within 500 feet of a bus line, but is more than 20 minutes. We're within 1,000 feet of another bus line. By the way, that's about a five minute walk um, that has more frequent buses, but is at 22 or 23 minutes between buses during the rush hour. If the city is serious about adding housing in all neighborhoods of the city, it needs to be more flexible on this somewhat arbitrary transit requirement. It is not clear to me that this barrier to adding housing was in the minds of our political leaders and housing advocates who have been pushing for zoning changes to provide more infill housing. It seems to be mixing priorities. I'd also like to suggest that we need a better outreach pro process to the denominations who have more staff that can help on this with multiple churches rather than trying to reach each church individually that doesn't necessarily have the staff to come here and deal with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michelle? Yes, hi, thank you, commissioners. Um, I'm Michelle DePass. I'm a longtime Albina resident, a resident of the Albina area. I still live there, and I love my historic community. Um, I'm just going to say I may speak a few seconds past the two minutes, um, but I'm here to remind you that in my culture, it's very impolite to um, interrupt an elder. <laughs> um, I'm here to testify in favor of the expanding opportunities for affordable housing draft if it will explicitly not harm my community. I'm here to advocate specifically on behalf of the code changes as they relate to the development of a community center at the Avail Gordley property at 4511 North Williams. I'm old enough to remember the uh, vibrance of Williams Avenue where I would walk with my grandmothers, uh, one from New Orleans, one from an immigrant from Panama and neither of whom owned a car. So we spent a lot of time on foot on, on Williams Avenue. And I recall the richness of the community there, the stores and the businesses, the people walking along the street, our family's Catholic parish. Um, my dad emigrated to Williams Avenue. Um, my parents met on Williams Avenue, and my first job at the Black Panther Free Health Clinic was on Williams. And I currently live about three blocks off of Williams. Um, so there was a rich community. It was not a community for the rich. 
I also remember a time when the neighborhood started to show the signs of neglect and disinvestment, when the city refused to offer garbage service, had a slow response time from the fire bureau. Um, the city literally let buildings burn in Albina, and I witnessed the lack of engagement from the Transportation Bureau when residents wanted to put a sidewalk in on Williams Avenue after a six-year-old was killed by vehicle. So the area is very important from a historic perspective, but it's um, also an economic because people had business there and used to make money there. Um, that's how they fed their families. It was in a particularly important area to black people coming from the Jim Crow South who um, experienced a sense of um, safety in numbers when they saw people that looked like them. I visited with Avil Gordley yesterday. I delivered some food for her and some dessert, and she wanted me to share these thoughts with you about the house at 4511 North Williams. Our parents bought this house at a time when black people could not buy property. We bought the house from a Jewish man, and they paid him back. And it's time to change the narrative from the land being taken to the land being restored and to help us reach the dream our ancestors had for this place. We are not victims. Um, we are resilient. We have each other and we are very strong. But it's time for us to reclaim that which has been stolen in the form of culture and land. So we have the opportunity today to reclaim a small piece of land in the form of this small plot that could house a community center and potentially housing with these draft code changes. Um, and she mentioned that the proof that we have this process at all is proof that we need to change the rules. And she also wanted me to thank you for hearing, hearing me out. Thank you so much. The next three will be um, Trell Anderson, Tonino Pacifico, Hope Keller, and after them, Bryson Davis, Joy Alice Davis, and Hoblin Lung. Holden, I'm not sure. I have Trell on the list to start, so let's begin there. Thank you, commissioners. Thanks for your time and consideration. Uh, I'm Trell Anderson, the executive director of Northwest Housing Alternatives. We were established in 1982 as an affordable housing development organization. We currently have 2,000 units in portfolio. We have 500 affordable homes in construction and production, and we have another 500 lined up that we're seeking funding for and opportunity, including 75 to 100 units here with Grace Memorial Church, as Pastor Elford had mentioned earlier in his testimony. Um, we're, all, we're also supportive of the Lebanon Land and Housing Coalition, thus the red tie, the only red that I could find in my wardrobe. <laughs> Uh, we're supportive of the initiative here, of course, and uh, in particular, we submitted a uh, request for a zone change of the property owned by Grace Memorial. Uh, their address is 1535 Northeast 17th Avenue. Um, we're requesting a change to rezone that uh, block to a CM3 and for consideration of the elimination of the design overlay. Um, to compare, uh, the CM4 proposed zone eliminates the direct ability to provide critically needed community art spaces that the pastor talked about and insists on conditional, land, conditional use process for all the religious and community service components. We're thinking there the kids camp and potentially the services that we provide to residents. Uh, also comparably, a CM2 zone does not uh, provide enough height, maximum height for affordable housing. It's limited at 45 feet. And that would not allow us to get to the scale that we need to pursue the public resources to develop the affordable housing. It wouldn't let us get to the 75 to 100 units. Um, regarding the design overlay, that's a costly process. I've been through it twice in this community. The first time it added around $800,000 just in material cost to the St. Francis Park Apartments project we did when I was at Catholic Charities at 12th and Stark. We're currently working on a project in Northwest Portland that has a historic design overlay. We're already $600,000 in just for the design process. We haven't even gotten to materials yet. So again, we asked for uh, a rezoning of the Grace Memorial site there for a CM3 
and elimination of the design requirement. We have a strong team that includes Carlton Hart Architecture and Walsh Construction, and we're ready to go. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Tonino? Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Tonino Pacifico. I'm a project manager for Habitat for Humanity, Portland Metro East. <clears throat> Habitat Excuse is me, dedicated. Could you pull the mic closer? Sure. Thank you so is much. This, uh, is this better? Okay. Habitat is dedicated to creating permanent affordability homeownership opportunities for working families earning 35 to 60 percent of area median income, which means, on average, a Habitat home buyer in Portland earns around $42,000 a year. <clears throat> I am here today to specifically talk about two adjoining properties in the Markham neighborhood that Habitat for Humanity Portland Metro East owns. Those addresses are 2401 Southwest Taylor's Ferry Road and 9134 Southwest 25th Avenue, Portland. We are requesting that these properties be considered as part of the Expanding Opportunities for Affordable Housing project to change the existing R7 zoning to R5 zoning in order to provide more affordable homes than what would be allowed under current zoning. Both lots are adjoining a combined comprised approximately 2.3 acres of land. We are told under the current R7 zoning we would expect to be able to develop around 12 new affordable homes with the size of the land and given Habitat's mission to provide affordable homes. It is our intention to build 15 to 20 new affordable homes on this property. By making this zoning change, we believe this will benefit the city of Portland. A few of the reasons why adding more affordable homes on this project will help the community is that research of Hoyt Habitat homeowners over the past 40 years shows that when families own their homes, their kids do better in school, employment is more stable, health indicators improve, and owners are more engaged in the community. We also sell our homes of the permanent affordability feature, a clause in the mortgage documents that stipulate that resale of a Habitat home will be affordable in perpetuity, which we believe will help prevent displacement and promote economic and cultural diversity in all of Portland's neighborhoods into the future. With the rental market migrating more and more out of the reach of average working families and causing instability and displacement, every single new affordable home ownership unit matters and it offers a real lifetime housing solution to families. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. A question? Yes. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Just looking at your property, I'm wondering how far into the development process are you? Um, we have not even hired a design team yet. So we've owned the land since 2017, and it is something that we're planning to possibly start next year. Okay. So you, you may not know whether you have a property line adjustment problem or not, but I can see you might. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> we're going for an EA in a, probably a month or two to help us find that out. Thank you. Okay. Hope? Okay, my name is Hope Keller. I'm uh, a member of St. Philip's Episcopal Church of the Deacon, and I'm also a member of the Levin community. I want I wanted to talk, just talk about the things that I find a problem. One of them is my my amount the amount of money that i have to pay has gone up considerably and since i and i'm a retired person i retired 20 years ago i went through a real hard retirement they they gave me one year to live and then i fooled them all because that's been 20 years yeah. now congratulations so i yeah i think that's great but unfortunately i'm still here so what i live next to the grotto and the grotto is a place where I don't know whether you know whether you know anything about the grotto, but the grotto is it's a real woodsy kind of place, and there are a lot of homeless people that are sleeping that live on the grotto. The people that own the grotto are don't do anything about it because they don't want to go up there and bother them. But the people that are homeless people tend to come to where I live because I live right next door to the grotto. And so there's, pardon? And there, there's a lot of problems with people there sleeping on our properties, doing things like that. And I, I know that we have to do something to help the people have somewhere to live because that is not right. You can't continue. It just gets more and more people there. You look out in the morning, there can be 20 or 30 tents up, and the police come along, chase them all the way. You, the next morning, there's more 
tents out there, but they're all different. So it's different people come. And so the, these types of things are not helping us any. And we have too many programs that are saying, that are saying, just a minute, just a minute, which turns into years, years. And so we don't, we keep talking about what we're going to do and what we want to do, but yet we keep getting all these restrictions about what we actually can do. And that's the thing that's bothering me because I've, you know, I've been here, I'm, you know, I'm a, a decently educated person. I have a master's degree and I w worked for years for Hewlett Packard. And so I know that there's a lot of things that can be done that we seem to be ignoring. And I just want to say that I think it's, we got to do more. We just got to do more. No ifs, ands, or buts. We got to do more. Thank you. Thank you. Bryson Davis, Joy Ellis Davis, and Holden Lung. And after them will be Sean Green and David Brink, and that's the end of my list. So if anyone had meant to speak, and I didn't mention your name yet, please share it with Julie. Um, Bryson. Thank you for allowing us to speak. Uh, my name is Bryson Davis. I'm an attorney at Sussman Schenck, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Williams and Russell Project Working Group. Uh, you already heard from Brian Terrett earlier at Legacy Health, who's also a liaison to, to our group, um, regarding the piece of land that is currently owned by Legacy Health and will be transferred um, in support of the project that we that we are that we're building um, and the key component of that project from what we've heard from what the community wants and what we've seen through our own work is um, affordable housing um, and a, a housing component to address both the displacement of people historically and then the rising costs of living in the neighborhood um, and we're asking to have the property rezoned from campus uh, institutional to CM3. Um, and it, part of that is, um, is the symbolism of taking the land that was zoned for the legacy, the Emanuel Hospital project, taking it out of that block of land and returning it back to what it was zoned for before it was appropriated for that project. And that symbolic move, um, in addition to the ability to do a little bit more uh, with as far as, as the project is concerned with the zoning, but that symbolic move is really key to for, for us as project working group members to go back to the, the people that we represent and the groups that we represent and the other people in the community and say, we are serious, the city is serious, legacy is serious about making sure this project goes forward um, and transfers from legacy, from the hospital um, to where we're going with this with this project. So I thank you for, for uh, letting us speak and, um, uh, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you so much for the time. Um, I also want to thank the many black Oregonians, both living and not with us, that are not privileged enough to be here today. I would like to honor them with my testimony. My name is Joy Elise Davis, and I'm the executive director of the Portland African American Leadership Forum, POLF. Today I'm speaking in support of the proposed draft, in particular, the property on 4511 North Williams Avenue, which is seeking an amendment to our current zoning of residential R1A to CM3D. In 2016, after years of leadership by Faye Birch and the Honorable Avril Gordley, in partnership with Self Enhancement Inc. and Prosper Portland, Paul launched an exciting property an uh, exciting pro uh, project to buy and preserve the historic Gordley Birch House home located at 451 North Williams Avenue. The families hope to develop a property that will be a cultural center and affordable housing, which honors the contributions of the family and the hundreds of other black families and organizations that have made lasting impact here in Portland. 
In this role at PULF, I've had the privilege of hearing the stories like Michelle's de Pass that just spoke from Black Oregonians who have lived, worked, and played in North Williams. They tell me stories of community strength, of family. They also share root shock. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but root shock is a term that talks about this, the trauma associated with being ripped out of your home, uh, similar to a plant that's being ripped out of their soil. The trauma that we're feeling today is not new for the black community. This is a serial issue that has been going on for decades here in Oregon and already in the country. When I first met the members of the Gurley Birch family, I can recall being in awe of their strength and resiliency, that despite the many attempts to push them out, to erase them through displacement, redlining, harassment, and disinvestment, and other forms of anti-black racism, they managed to hold on to a property that was never intended for them. Words cannot describe the community, how powerful this community center would be for the black community as well as the family. The family and the community has been told over and over again for decades that the city does not belong to them. This is an opportunity for you all to use your power and your privilege to do the right thing. We have seen evidence of racist and anti-black racism in planning with PSU's recently study of racist housing policies, with BPS's own report on the historical context of racial planning, a history of how planning segregated Portland, and in the number of black owner, homeowners that we see today and business owners in the North and Northeast area as well as the number of resources that have poured into the neighborhood but not poured into the people who made it what it is today. As urban planners, designers, and practitioners, we have the power to take our well-intended equity statements and put our words to the test. This is only the beginning of addressing Portland's anti-Black racism within its planning processes, but this is the, the process that community deserves. And honestly, we deserve way, way more than this process. Exchanging this zone process for PALF in particular is a very, very expensive process, something that we demand that you all change here today. We really have the opportunity here to, to really have an equitable Portland, and it really starts with you all today doing the right thing, and I really urge you to support this project. Thank you very much. And I butchered your name twice already, so please help me out. <laughs> actually, you did it pretty good, actually. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My First name is Holden, and last name is Le, and I'm the vice chair of the Portland Chinese Christians and Missionary Alliance Church. And today I'm coming to uh, testify to request for zone change from CE, which is a commercial employment zone, to the CM2, mixed commercial zone 2. So the uh, PCCMA church has been serving the Lance Towns neighborhood since uh, 1984, for the over the last uh, 40 years, we've been serving at the same locations, but at the same time we grow with the Asian community in the uh, Lens neighborhood. With that said, we have acquired uh, a couple uh, properties, including the 7435 Southeast Foster, 7407 to 7415 Southeast Foster, and also 5016 Southeast 74th Avenue and uh, 5008 Southeast 74th uh, Avenue. So we understand that currently out with the Lansdowns expansions, I see a lot of new structure, new infrastructure. Uh, personally, I'm the CEO of the Asian Health and Service Center. We build our headquarters on uh, Southeast 91st and uh, Foster but that is a uh, more service building. For the church, we see that our uh, opportunity in the CE zone will allow us to develop properties that will foster ripens and healthy neighborhood, including space for language school, youth activity space, jobs, uh, skill training activities, and a daycare center. And with the understanding about the expanding opportunity, we see that PCCMA church uh, can also consider to include affordable housing in order to support the growing Asian immigrants and families uh, in the Lansdowns uh, neighborhood. As such, we would like to ask the uh, opportunity and then request for a zone change for, to CM2, a mixed commercial uh, two, which will allow us up to 55 feet and with the uh, affordable housing bonus. Again, uh, on the west side of our church property is a CM2 zone, and the east side is the CM zone, a CE zone. So our hope 
is to get the support from the commissioners so that the church can acquire a bigger uh, visions. And I, uh, I, I was so touched by all those testify about the housing needs of the uh, community. So that's why the church would like to step forward, but need your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Yeah. We have Sean Green and may perhaps David Brink, if he's around. Sean, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Chairs and commissioners, my name is Sean Green. I'm on the board of the Save and Community Association. I'm vice chair of the Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods, and I'm on the advisory committee for the Bureau of Development Services. I'm speaking here today on behalf of myself. I'm encouraged that the zoning code project will help fulfill the 2035 comprehensive plan's vision of increasing the amount of affordable housing in our city by removing zoning barriers faced by community-based organizations. The Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods top land use priority is affordability. Our board is going to take up this proposal at our next meeting on Tuesday. I, along with the Northeast Coalition's Land Use and Transportation Committee, believe that more affordable housing could be created if community-based organizations are allowed to redevelop up to 100% of their existing parking into housing. This would provide community-based organizations the freedom to determine how much of their existing property to convert into housing while continuing to meet their strategic goals. Removing barriers for community-based organizations to redevelop their unused and underutilized property into housing will create a valuable new source of affordable housing in our city. We have the opportunity for a zoning code to provide pathways instead of barriers to creating more affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming out here, sharing your stories, your time, your testimony, and the leadership from your communities. We really appreciate that, so thank you. Staff, would you like to come on up? It's hard to imagine us doing justice to all these amendments in 10 minutes. So I guess the first question you guys have already figured out is, if we did a recommendation at our next meeting, could you still hit that city council date? And the other question I've got is whether we should keep the record open or should we close it to, to move to discussion? Um, if you're going to discuss okay. more, um, it's up to you whether you want to okay. keep the record open. I, 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 I think that we should close the record then so we can. But why don't we see where we end up before we decide to close the record? I mean, I guess. Yes. Okay, well, yes, sure. Thank you. I'll close the oral testimony. Thank you for all those who've spoken that. And I guess we'll make a decision on closing written testimony based on our next steps. Yeah, so I guess the first question is, is, is it a hard uh, stop at 430 or can you spend 10 more, 15 more minutes or where, where are the... I'll ask that of my fellow commissioners. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the realistic reputation is it might take 30 extra minutes to get through this. Um, and and I'm, I'm not sure that we can get people to stick that long. Okay, so you want us to wrap up in 10 or 15 then? We do 15 over? Anyone? Okay, I guess we get 15 minutes over, so we have okay. 20 minutes or 25. Yeah. What we probably can do is uh, we have um, looked at all the zone change requests that came in through testimony, so we could go over that and answer questions about that and try and get that out of the way. That's fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't hear any new site changes that we weren't already aware of and hadn't already analyzed, so we can give you a bit of information about any concerns we have on any of those. Okay. And then would your thinking be that we have a vote on it today or at the future meeting? There's probably enough complexity in the code change amendments and testimony that we will have to do that at a future meeting, and so let's try and also nail down what well, those key issues are. you want to address. Um, and we'll come back and try and get that done. Uh, okay. We're confident we can get this to council in a reasonable amount of time after you, regardless of whether you vote today or in March. That just It's a matter of when in April we end up at, at council or if it's early May, but it's still within a fairly close time period. Okay. Well, given limited time, one idea would we oftentimes do a quick go around to see if anyone has things to mention based on the testimony they heard. Um, would commissioners, I think I'll, I'll ask commissioners to just do, do that as quickly as they can so that we flag any items. Okay. And that'll include one or two commissioners on the telephone right now. So does anyone want to start with that? I might be able to expedite that by telling you what I've heard from commissioners so far, sure. and then anyone can just add if there, if I miss something. Okay. Um, I know we've heard um, from a, a variety of people about the parking issue and whether we should amend that um, to allow more parking to be removed. Um, 
I know we heard about the property line adjustment issue. Um, we, we did get a request from the Bureau of Development Services for a small collection of additional code clarifications. Um, and maybe it's appropriate that we hand out that now so you have it. It's a, we have a sheet with code amendments. Um, is that the one that was attached to your? No, no this is an updated one. Um, no, you don't need to do the memo anymore. That's kind of been su superseded by this. But this is a, includes both the BDS changes and then language for various things that we've heard from each of you. Um, so those are the things we've heard about in the code. Are there any beyond those items people would like to flag? Yes, Ben. There was one that piqued my interest because it's kind of a unique case. The one near the freeway, um, the re going from R2.5 to CM2 with CM3 provisions for height. Um, it's 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 a big jump, but um, I think it's it's an interesting proposition, especially if it's the height is concentrated on the freeway. I just wanted to get your opinion on how that might look like from a code standpoint. Okay, we'll go over that in a second when we deal with the map changes. I think you did save us some time then. Then let's go to what you're going to present. Okay, so um, oh, Andy, I guess I, I guess I, w I was thinking that Eric was saving the time by summarizing to the group. Is there any other items he didn't mention beyond PLAs on property line adjustments? Yes, Kat. Um, you may not be able to answer this now, but I, I guess I would like to understand if there is a process for um, reducing the hurdles moving forward for all community-based organizations to basically get in, be able to go to BDS later with this. If they miss this opportunity, how do we put together a process that allows BDS to quickly review it? Okay, we'll look at that question and get back to you then. Perfect. And that was my question too. Okay. Jeff? Yeah. And I just have a general overview. As as we work through these questions, I really hope we're gonna err on the side of accommodating everything I've heard today from these faith based groups. I'm sure there's always a technical reason why it's not quite the right fit. But that's exactly why we're in this process. We heard from more than a few of these organizations that they're trying to navigate the development code. These organizations are giving us a great opportunity to address our housing crisis. They have lots of excess land. They, we can trust them that they're mission oriented. And I think this is an opportunity, a rare one we have, where we can try to peel back the complexity of our code to help these organizations help us help address our housing crisis. And I, I just hope generally, as we look at each thing that everyone's requested, whether it's a code change or someone wants to remove design overlay, that we don't look for the reasons why the code doesn't quite allow that and that we take advantage of the authority we do have to recommend these steps to city council. Let's really be proactive in helping these organizations help address our housing crisis. We, we just don't get a lot of opportunities to do this when we deal with the code and I just, hope we'll take advantage of it. So I don't have anything specific, but I just hope we can accommodate the kinds of things we heard today. Thanks, any other thoughts? Okay. So with this, the 11 sites that we heard testimony on for, for additional zone changes um, and, and comprehensive plan map changes, um, this screen, we looked at them for infrastructure, red flags, are there any reasons from a, um, suitability perspective, we wouldn't recommend a change. Generally, there are a few issues, but um, for the most part, we did not find red flags that would tell us that these can't be rezoned. Um, some of the sites have substandard streets or environmental overlays, or um, but those are things that can be resolved on a site development level, and there's it's not necessarily a reason to not do a zone change. Um, the one site at 74th and Foster has some projected traffic congestion problems in 2035, but it is on a frequent service bus line. And the change in that case is um, if they were doing a big up zone in density, that might be an issue. But in this case, they're asking to go from CE to CM2, which is kind of a parallel thing that mainly is benefiting the, them in terms of allowed height, but it's, it's a similar density. So from a traffic impact perspective, it probably is not a concern in this case, and as I said, it's a frequent service bus line. So um, 
the Habitat for Humanity site on Taylor's Ferry has some stormwater constraints potentially and some substandard streets, but it's also only a few blocks from a potential light rail station on Southwest Barber. So there's some mitigating factor there as well, maybe. So I think from an infrastructure's perspective, we had no reason to say no to those 11 projects. Um, Nan already mentioned uh, one situation where we're asking you to remove uh, what had been a potential hacienda site from the zone change map because it's not in community control and that transaction apparently isn't going forward. Um, the only other one that raised a potential scope question for us was the one on uh, 4515 and 4505 North Mississippi. Um, that was a request from an individual property owner. And I understand that they have some interests and there's a, some Prosper Portland and, and BDS involvement in that. Um, but it is potentially outside of the scope of what we advertised with this project, which was uh, community organizations and institutions. So um, we would have some concern about opening this process up to other individual property owners who may want who may have good reasons for a zone change, but that wasn't really the intent of this project. Uh, so that was our only only catch in terms of the criteria that we had originally set up for these changes. Um, the ones that, um, just going to the map issue, this is the one on Sumner. Um, that's one where they had asked for the, the CM2 or potentially some CM3 uh, height or code elements. We don't really have a process to do a hybrid code or a map, so um, our recommendation here was to go with the CM2 because that's uh, nearby. Um, so that was that was one. It, it's in an R2.5 area, but it's very close to a light rail station and near a major corridor, Killingsworth, so it, it's only a block away. Um, this is the Mount Scott, um, which is one of the ones with the property line issues. This is the one I mentioned, Habitat for Humanity on Taylor's Ferry. The um, I-5 corridor is just at the upper left-hand corner of that map where the light rail station would be beyond that. Be under, there's a road that goes under the freeway there. Um, this is the Robeson Jewish home. There's an environmental overlay, but again, uh, we didn't see other infrastructure concerns. This is the Williams and Russell site that, that was part of the Emanuel um, plan. Um, this is Grace Memorial. Um, I would mention um, there was a request in the testimony to remove the D overlay. And, and as a matter of policy in the comprehensive plan, the, the CM3 always comes with a D. So it may be problematic to, to honor that removal of the D because that would probably violate our comprehensive plan policies. I wondered about that, um, but the, there's, it's there's not a reason we couldn't support the CM3 there. It isn't well. I think this I, is the clay residence, the one that was from an individual property owner. Um, it's at the Jog in Albina, Mississippi. There, Kat. The I believe the third testifier on this, or the last one, maybe was a better way to put it. Um, can't remember the um, individual's name. Mentioned that there there did seem to be some community organization function as a part of the clay. And I so that caught my attention and I guess as a way to tie it back into being a community organization or Do so, you want to describe the context of that and to your understanding? Yeah, I think that um, there is a future opportunity for that and so that's kind of how it was framed. Right now it's um, it's more of a generational wealth building opportunity for this family. And um, Diane Clay, who spoke earlier, uh, does have a business model of a shared housing um, that she wants to take to more properties. So um, it is um, similar to, in terms of mission-based, it's similar to that, but I can't say that it's actually a community-based organization, 501c3. Just a suggestion, perhaps a letter from Prosper or something in the record to just support her request. I don't know if we want to keep the record. I know that um, she's been working with Prosper Portland and also with um, 
uh, I'm blanking on their name, but um, Miso uh, in Northeast Portland, um, and they weren't able to testify today, but um, they are a small community-based organization that is that has a mission of helping people get their businesses growing. We could defer this one to the next meeting and invite testimony on this topic. Just, of I'm, what I'm just trying to, I mean, quite frankly, this is the kind of thing I'd like to help this person, even though it's not precisely in our mission and scope, and maybe to have a record to support that. Some support from a community-based group would be great, or even prosper, if that's just something to kind of ha have a record to say, this is why we, we stepped out, if the rest of the commissioners agree, we, we kind of I would we made a little that, broad exception yeah. to our scope in this one case. Yeah, so. and I would say that one other thing is I'm the district liaison for this, and so I can kind of pull my community into that. Okay. Just a thought, however you guys feel. Do you want to keep going? Sure. Um, this is one that was on Northeast uh, 33rd. It's just south of the project that is um, converting what I believe was a um, is a large a, a church property, church, yeah. um, and it's um, south of the man yeah. property, uh, the, which did get a rezone. It's not showing yet on the map, but it will through the better housing by design. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, this is the Mount Tabor Presbyterian site. It is a, a budding the R two zone Chinese Christian on seventy um, fourth and Foster. And as they noted, it is a, a directly abutting the zone they're asking for. This is St. Andrews in, on Southwest Sunset. So those were the additional sites. Any other questions? As I mentioned earlier, we, we're okay recommending, as a, from a staff point of view, 10 of those 11. And, and the, the discussion you just had about the the clay property we, we'd be happy to invite additional testimony to clarify that question about this how it how community organizations may benefit was portsmouth yeah. union on here they were in the initial proposal already okay. so um i missed that okay if you want to look at any of the sites that were in the original proposal we also have those maps Got it. Okay. so they're just listed under union in there is they're that actually it? not in the original proposal they have the zoning that they need their hurdle is the conditional use. Oh, process. okay. Sorry. Okay, so they support it. Got it. Okay. Um, Jeff? Just so quick question. So the one item you're not supporting is the removing the design overlay. And I just want to clarify, you said you don't you're not comfortable with that because the the comp plan says CM threes are always in the, a design. The comprehensive or? plan designation um, description includes a statement that says CM3 is always accompanied by a D, and that's in the comprehensive plan. At this time, if you're doing housing, do you not, I'm trying to remind me, remember, do you not have the, or do you have the option still to do a type 2 instead of a type 3? The DOZA project, I believe, is changing the criteria or the threshold to type 2 or 2X. I'm not too familiar with that, but th that changing that has been part of the DOZA project. And I think DOZA is making it permanent versus now it's in there as an emergency or something, if I remember correctly. But anyway, that might be just something to check on mm -hmm. as yeah. a way to alleviate. If they're doing housing, it would be a type two review and option. But but we can't, the comprehensive plan really prohibits, outright prohibits us from removing a deal really that's. Well, I don't know if the word prohibit is well, in there, okay. but it, it says that, that it's, it's always accompanied by a D. It could raise yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah. No, I, I understand. I mean, I, I'm willing to push things as far as possible, but I, I understand that. I, that I do want to clarify that that project is a multi use. Oh, okay. Yeah, mixed use project. It's not going to be 100% housing. I had one question, which I might not have heard correctly, is on the 4511 North Williams property. Um, which I think with Avil Gordley House yeah. requesting to go to CM3. I just wanted to make sure that that's, that zone is consistent with what they want to do with the property. Is there some minimum density with CM3 that would make it hard to just have a single family house there? Or I might not have been caught it off. Um, well, the, see, the commercial mixed use zones, you're not required to do housing. If you do housing, then there is a minimum density that kicks in. Okay. I just want to make sure that whoever's proposing it oh, recognizes. The limitations of the zone or minimum densities there. Um, Chris has a question. Yeah, I, I think Dan just started to raise a point that I was interested in, is that 
uh, I heard requests for uses other than pure housing, including you know health clinic, transitional housing. Uh, are those uses going to fit within the zone changes that we're looking at? The That's sorry. the Emanuel Ch uh, Temple Church. Um, I think most of those are going to mixed use zoning, the ones that I know about. But um, yes, there is always that possibility that when there is a new development being proposed that they're going to add on programs as well. I, I would also say we have a whole different project that's focused on shelter and homeless services and um, looking at the zoning code to to expedite those processes, and that's coming to you this summer. So um, we heard some testimony about um, shelters and alternative forms of shelters and sleeping pods and, and um, day services for homeless um, populations, and, and those are being explicitly looked at in that project that's coming this summer. So this project does not necessarily solve all those problems, but we're working on that. Okay. We have five minutes in our extended time. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, Katie. Well, I just wanted to uh, address the audience that's still here. And um, I, you know, one of the things when I was going through the, um, the testimony was how many people wanted to take advantage of the changes to, you know, that the um, developmental services could make where you're changing zoning or whatever. And I think that that's an ask that you guys need to make is that that could be a regular thing for you to take advantage of, not just this particular instant. I'm not sure if we can even, we can recommend that. I don't believe that this commission can actually say, yes, now it is so. Um, that's something the city, the, um, the commissioners would, want, would do. But um, if you can get a lot of people to go to a hearing, then you should do such a thing. <laughs> anyway, that's my recommendation, and um, good luck. And you, you know, there's lots more hurdles, as you know, and if you've heard, that there's lots more hurdles to to uh, most of them having to do with financing. But um, I I hope that you're forming alliances with each other so that you can um, work together to get that those things done. And it's I think it'll be a wonderful journey. I think there probably must be alliances already to have this many people turn up. And I, Thank you I for hope that you can hear me because I don't think I had this on. Okay. Steph, do you want to say something? Nope. Okay. I was just, I, I think I heard you actually say something that had that I heard was included. I did not have that on. So, so unless someone has a concern, I think perhaps you leave the record open until the end of Friday. Any concerns with that? That way you get a chance, Jeff, as Jeff mentioned, for some more comments to come in. Um, so I'll say the record's open until 5 p.m. Friday, and we will continue this conversation and probably conclude it on March 10th at our next meeting. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, commissioners. One last item from Seth. I'm sorry, point of yeah. order. Uh, so that we, we have to pass everything or nothing right now, correct? Um, it would come back to us to go through the amendments as we normally okay. would, and then... Um, pass a package. Okay. I was just like, let's do it now. Okay. Yeah. I would say, let's do it now, except we got a few things yeah, on the code side of it that we want to get right. And um, I think some of the testimony we received today might prompt us to go a little further than we might otherwise have gone. So. Yeah. What I heard was we're, we're still working on the parking question. We're, we're going to look at the PLA question mm -hmm. in more depth. Um, there's one of the zone change sites that we are inviting additional testimony about how it, it potentially relates to the project purpose. Um, and we haven't really gone through the sheet we handed out with the amendment, the other technical amendments, okay. so we'll, we'll do all that. And then Kat mentioned when is potential expedited process oh, right. that, outside this. The, is there a way to do this in a more ongoing way or yeah. through BDS? All right. Thank you. We're adjourned.